Read by Winston Tharp. Zigzags of Treachery, Part One, Chapter One. All I know about Doctor Estep's death, I said, is the stuff in the papers. Vance Richmond's lean, gray face took on an expression of distaste. The newspapers aren't always either thorough or accurate. I'll give you the salient points as I know them, though I suppose you'll want to go over the ground for yourself and get your information first-hand. I nodded, and the attorney went on, shaping each word precisely with his thin lips before giving it sound. Dr. Estep came to San Francisco in 98 or 99, a young man of 25, just through qualifying for his license. He opened an office here, and, as you probably know, became in time a rather excellent surgeon. He married two or three years after he came here. There were no children. He and his wife seemed to have been a bit happier together than the average. Of his life before coming to San Francisco, nothing is known. He told his wife briefly that he had been born and raised in Parkersburg, West Virginia, but that his home life had been so unpleasant that he was trying to forget it, and that he did not like to talk or even think about it. Bear that in mind. Two weeks ago, on the third of the month, a woman came to his office in the afternoon. His office was in his residence on Pine Street. Lucy Coe, who was Dr. Estep's nurse and assistant, showed the woman into his office, and then went back to her own desk in the reception room. She didn't hear anything the doctor said to the woman, but through the closed door she heard the woman's voice now and then, a high and anguished voice, apparently pleading. Most of the words were lost upon the nurse, but she heard one coherent sentence, "'Please, please,' she heard the woman cry, "'don't turn me away.' The woman was with Dr. Estep for about fifteen minutes and left sobbing into a handkerchief. Dr. Estep said nothing about the caller, either to his nurse or to his wife, who didn't learn of it until after his death. The next day, toward evening, while the nurse was putting on her hat and coat, preparatory to leaving for home, Dr. Estep came out of his office with his hat on and a letter in his hand. The nurse saw that his face was pale, white as my uniform, she says, and he walked with the care of one who takes pains to keep from staggering. She asked him if he was ill. Oh, it's nothing, he told her. I'll be all right in a very few minutes. Then he went on out. The nurse left the house just behind him and saw him drop the letter he had carried into the mailbox on the corner, after which he returned to the house. Mrs. Estep, coming downstairs ten minutes later, it couldn't have been any later than that, heard, just as she reached the first floor, the sound of a shot from her husband's office. She rushed into it, meeting nobody. Her husband stood by his desk swaying, with a hole in his right temple and a smoking revolver in his hand. Just as she reached him and put her arms around him, he fell across the desk, dead. Anybody else? Any of the servants, for instance, able to say that Mrs. Estep didn't go into the office until after the shot? I asked. The attorney shook his head sharply. No, damn it! That's where the rub comes in. His voice, after this one flare of feeling, resumed its level, incisive tone, and he went on with his tale. The next day's papers had account of Dr. Estep's death, and late that morning the woman who had called upon him the day before his death came to the house. She is Dr. Estep's first wife, which is to say his legal wife. There seems to be no reason, not the slightest, for doubting it, as much as I'd like to. They were married in Philadelphia in 96. She has a certified copy of the marriage record. I had the matter investigated in Philadelphia. 
and it's a certain fact that Dr. Estep and this woman, Edna Fife was her maiden name, were really married. She says that Estep, after living with her in Philadelphia for two years, deserted her. That would have been in 98 or just before he came to San Francisco. She has sufficient proof of her identity, that she really is the Edna Fife who married him, and my agents in the East found positive proof that Estep had practiced for two years in Philadelphia. And here is another point. I told you that Estep had said he was born and raised in Parkersburg. I had inquiries made there, but found nothing to show that he had ever lived there, and found ample evidence to show that he had never lived at the address he had given his wife. There is, then, nothing for us to believe except that his talk of an unhappy early life was a ruse to ward off embarrassing questions. Did you do anything toward finding out whether the doctor and his first wife had ever been divorced? I asked. I'm having that taken care of now, but I hardly expect to learn that they had. That would be too crude. To get on with my story, this woman, the first Mrs. Estep, had said that she had just recently learned her husband's whereabouts, and had come to see him in an attempt to effect a reconciliation. When she called upon him the afternoon before his death, he asked for a little time to make up his mind what he should do. He promised to give her his decision in two days. My personal opinion, after talking to the woman several times, is that she had learned that he had accumulated some money, and that her interest was more in getting the money than in getting him. But that, of course, is neither here nor there. At first, the authorities accepted the natural explanation of the doctor's death, suicide. But after the first wife's appearance, the second wife, my client, was arrested and charged with murder. The police theory is that after his first wife's visit, Dr. Estep told his second wife the whole story, and that she, brooding over the knowledge that he had deceived her, that she was not his wife at all, finally worked herself up into a rage, went to the office after his nurse had left for the day, and shot him with a revolver that she knew he always kept in his desk. I don't know, of course, just what evidence the prosecution has, but from the newspapers I gather that the case against her will be built upon her fingerprints on the revolver with which he was killed, an upset inkwell on his desk, splashes of ink on the dress she wore, and an inky print of her hand on a torn newspaper on his desk. Unfortunately, but perfectly naturally, one of the first things she did was to take the revolver out of her husband's hand. That accounts for her prints on it. He fell, as I told you, just as she put her arms around him, and though her memory isn't very clear on this point, the probabilities are that he dragged her with him when he fell across the desk. That accounts for the upset inkwell, the torn paper, and the splashes of ink. But the prosecution will try to persuade the jury that these things all happened before the shooting, that they are proofs of a struggle. Not so bad, I gave my opinion. Or pretty damned bad, depending on how you look at it. And this is the worst time imaginable for a thing like this to come up. Within the past few months, there have been no less than five widely advertised murders of men by women who were supposed to have been betrayed or deceived or one thing or another. Not one of these five women was convicted. As a result, we have the press, the public, and even the pulpit howling for a stricter enforcement of justice. The newspapers are lined up against Mrs. Estep as strongly as their fear of libel suits will permit. 
The women's clubs are lined up against her. Everybody is clamoring for an example to be made of her. Then, as if all that isn't enough, the prosecuting attorney has lost his last two big cases, and he'll be out for blood this time. Election day isn't far off. The calm, even precise voice was gone now, and its place was a passionate eloquence. "'I don't know what you think,' Richmond cried. "'You're a detective. This is an old story to you. You are more or less callous, I suppose, and skeptical of innocence in general. But I know that Mrs. Estep didn't kill her husband. I don't say it because she's my client. I was Dr. Estep's attorney and his friend, and if I thought Mrs. Estep guilty, I'd do everything in my power to help convict her.' "'but I know as well as I know anything "'that she didn't kill him, couldn't have killed him. "'She's innocent. "'But I know, too, that if I go into court "'with no defense beyond what I have now, "'she'll be convicted. "'There has been too much leniency shown feminine criminals,' "'public sentiment says. "'The pendulum will swing the other way. "'Mrs. Estep, if convicted, We'll get the limit. I'm putting it up to you. Can you save her? Our best mark is the letter he mailed just before he died, I said, ignoring everything he said that didn't have to do with the facts of the case. It's good betting that when a man writes and mails a letter and then shoots himself, that the letter isn't altogether unconnected with a suicide. Did you ask the wife about the letter? I did and she denies having received one. That wasn't right. If the doctor had been driven to suicide by her appearance, then according to all the rules there are, the letter should have been addressed to her. He might have written one to his second wife, but he would hardly have mailed it. Would she have any reason for lying about it? Yes, the lawyer said slowly. I think she would. His will leaves everything to the second wife. The first wife, being the only legal wife, will have no difficulty in breaking that will, of course. But if it is shown that the second wife had no knowledge of the first one's existence, that she really believed herself to be Dr. Estep's legal wife, then I think that she will receive at least a portion of the estate. I don't think any court would, under the circumstances, take everything away from her. But if she should be found guilty of murdering Dr. Estep, then no consideration will be shown her, and the first wife will get every penny. Did he leave enough to make half of it, say, worth sending an innocent person to the gallows for? He left about half a million, roughly. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars isn't a mean inducement. Do you think it would have been enough for the first wife, from what you've seen of her? "'Candidly, I do. "'She didn't impress me as being a person of very many active scruples. "'Where does his first wife live?' I asked. "'She's staying at the Montgomery Hotel now. "'Her home is in Louisville, I believe. "'I don't think you will gain anything by talking to her, however. "'She has retained Somerset, Somerset and Quill to represent her, "'a very reputable firm, by the way.' and she'll refer you to them. They will tell you nothing. But if there's anything dishonest about her affairs, such as the concealing of Dr. Estep's letter, I'm confident that Somerset, Somerset, and Quill know nothing of it. Can I talk to the second Mrs. Estep, your client? Not at present, I'm afraid, though perhaps in a day or two. She is on the verge of collapse just now. She has always been delicate, and the shock of her husband's death, followed by her own arrest and imprisonment, have been too much for her. She's in the city jail, you know, held without bail. I've tried to have her transferred to the prisoner's ward of the city hospital, even, but the authorities seem to think that her illness is simply a ruse. I'm worried about her. She's really in a critical condition." His voice was losing its calmness again, so I picked up my hat, said something about starting to work at once, and went out. I don't like eloquence, 
If it isn't effective enough to pierce your hide, it's tiresome. And if it is effective enough, then it muddles your thoughts. Chapter 2 I spent the next couple of hours questioning the Estep servants, to no great advantage. None of them had been near the front of the house at the time of the shooting, and none had seen Mrs. Estep immediately prior to her husband's death. After a lot of hunting, I located Lucy Coe, the nurse, in an apartment on Vallejo Street. She was a small, brisk, business-like woman of thirty or so. She repeated what Vance Richmond had told me and could add nothing to it. That cleaned up the S-step end of the job, and I set out for the Montgomery Hotel, satisfied that my only hope for success, barring miracles, which usually don't happen, lay in finding the letter that I believed Dr. Estep had written to his first wife. My drag with the Montgomery Hotel management was pretty strong, strong enough to get me anything I wanted that wasn't too far outside the law, so as soon as I got there, I hunted up Stacy, one of the assistant managers. This Mrs. Estep who's registered here, I asked. What do you know about her? Nothing myself, but if you'll wait a few minutes, I'll see what I can learn. The assistant manager was gone about ten minutes. No one seems to know much about her, he told me when he came back. I've questioned the telephone girls, bellboys, maids, clerks, and the house detective, but none of them could tell me much. She registered from Louisville on the 2nd of the month. She has never stopped here before, and she seems unfamiliar with the city, asks quite a few questions about how to get around. The mail clerks don't remember handling any mail for her, nor do the girls on the switchboard have any record of phone calls for her. She keeps regular hours, usually goes out at 10 or later in the morning, and gets in before midnight. She doesn't seem to have any callers or friends. Will you have her mail watched? Let me know what postmarks and return addresses are on any letters she gets? Certainly. And have the girls on the switchboard put their ears up against any talking she does over the wire? Yes. Is she in her room now? No, she went out a little while ago. Fine. I'd like to go up and take a look at her stuff. Stacy looked sharply at me and cleared his throat. Is it as, uh, important as all that? I want to give you all the assistance I can, but... It's this important, I assured him, that another woman's life depends on what I can learn about this one. All right, he said. I'll get the clerk to let us know if she comes in before we're through, and we'll go right up. The woman's room held two valises and a trunk, all unlocked, and containing not the least thing of importance, no letters, nothing. So little, in fact, that I was more than half convinced that she had expected her things to be searched. Downstairs again, I planted myself in a comfortable chair within sight of the key rack, and waited for a view of this first Mrs. Estep. She came in at 11.15 that night, a large woman of 45 or 50, well-dressed, and carrying herself with an air of assurance. Her face was a little too hard to mouth and chin, but not enough to be ugly. A capable-looking woman. A woman who would get what she went after. Chapter 3 Eight o'clock was striking as I went into the Montgomery Hotel the next morning and picked out a chair, this time within eye range of the elevators. At 10.30, Mrs. Estep left the hotel with me in her wake. Her denial of a letter from her husband, written immediately before his death, had come to her, didn't fit in with the possibilities as I saw them, and a good motto for the detective business is, when in doubt, shadow him. After eating breakfast at a restaurant on O'Farrell Street, she turned toward the shopping district. And for a long, long time, though I suppose it was a lot shorter than it seemed to me, she led me through the most densely packed portions of the most crowded department stores she could find. She didn't buy anything, but she did a lot of thorough looking, with me muddling along behind her trying to act like a little fat guy on an errand for his wife, while stout women bumped me and thin ones prodded me and all sorts got in my way and walked on my feet. Finally, after I had sweated off a couple of pounds... She left the shopping district and cut up through Union Square, walking along casually as if out for a stroll. Three-quarters way through, she turned abruptly and retraced her steps, looking sharply at everyone she passed. I was on a bench, reading a stray page from a day-old newspaper when she went by. She walked on down Post Street to Kearney, 
stopping every now and then to look, or to pretend to look, in store windows, while I ambled along sometimes behind her, sometimes almost by her side, and sometimes in front. She was trying to check up the people around her, trying to determine whether she was being followed or not. But here, in the busy part of town, that gave me no cause for worry. On a less crowded street, it might have been different, though not necessarily so. There are four rules for shadowing. Keep behind your subject as much as possible. Never try to hide from him. Act in a natural manner, no matter what happens. And never meet his eye. Obey them and except in unusual circumstances, shadowing is the easiest thing that a sleuth has to do. Assured after a while that no one was following her, Mrs. Estep turned back toward Powell Street and got into a taxi cab at the St. Francis stand. I picked out a modest touring car from the rank of hire cars along the Geary Street side of Union Square and set out after her. Our route was out Post Street to Laguna, where the taxi presently swung into the curb and stopped. The woman got out, paid the driver, and went up the steps of an apartment building. With idling engine, my own car had come to rest against the opposite curb in the block above. As the taxicab disappeared around a corner, Mrs. Estep came out of the apartment building doorway, went back to the sidewalk, and started down Laguna Street. Pass her, I told my chauffeur, and we drew down upon her. As we came abreast, she went up the front steps of another building, and this time she rang a bell. These steps belonged to a building apparently occupied by four flats, each with its separate door, and the button she had pressed belonged to the right-hand second-story flat. Under cover of my car's rear curtains, I kept my eye on the doorway while my driver found a convenient place to park in the next block. I kept my eye on the vestibule until 5.35 p.m., when she came out, walked to the Sutter Street car line, returned to the Montgomery, and went to her room. I called up the old man, the Continental Detective Agency's San Francisco manager, and asked him to detail an operative to learn who and what were the occupants of the Laguna Street flat. That night, Mrs. Estep ate dinner at her hotel and went to a show afterward, and she displayed no interest in possible shadowers. She went to her room at a little after eleven, and I knocked off for the day. Chapter 4 The following morning I turned the woman over to Dick Foley and went back to the agency to wait for Bob Teal, the operative who had investigated the Laguna Street flat. He came in at a little after ten. A guy named Jacob Ledwich lives there, Bob said. He's a crook of some sort, but I don't know just what. He and Wap Haley are friendly, so he must be a crook. Porky Grout says he's an ex-bunko man who is in with a gambling ring now, but Porky would tell you a bishop was a safe ripper if he thought it would mean five bucks for himself. This Ledwich goes out mostly at night, and he seems to be pretty prosperous, probably a high-class worker of some kind. He's got a Buick, license number 645-221, that he keeps in a garage around the corner from his flat, but he doesn't seem to use the car much. What sort of looking fellow is he? A big guy, six feet or better, and he'll weigh a couple hundred easy. He's got a funny mug on him. It's broad and heavy around the cheeks and jaw, but his mouth is a little one that looks like it was made for a smaller man. He's no youngster, middle-aged. Suppose you tail him around for a day or two, Bob, and see what he's up to. Try to get a room or apartment in the neighborhood, a place you can cover his front door from. Chapter 5 Vance Richmond's lean face lighted up as soon as I mentioned Ledwich's name to him. Yes, he exclaimed. He was a friend, or at least an acquaintance of Dr. Estep's. I met him once, a large man with a particularly inadequate mouth. I dropped in to see the doctor one day, and Ledwich was in the office. Dr. Estep introduced us. What do you know about him? Nothing. Don't you know whether he was intimate with the doctor or just a casual acquaintance? No. For all I know, he might have been a friend, a patient, or almost anything. The doctor never spoke of him to me, and nothing passed between them while I was there that afternoon. I simply gave the doctor some information he had asked for and left. Why? 
Dr. Estep's first wife, after going to a lot of trouble to see that she wasn't followed, connected with Ledwich yesterday afternoon, and from what we can learn, he seems to be a crook of some sort. What would that indicate? I'm not sure what it means, but I can do a lot of guessing. Ledwich knew both the doctor and the doctor's first wife. Then it's not a bad bet that she knew where her husband was all the time. If she did, then it's another good bet that she was getting money from him right along. Can you check up his accounts and see whether he was passing out any money that can't be otherwise accounted for? The attorney shook his head. No, his accounts are in rather bad shape, carelessly kept. He must have had more than a little difficulty with his income tax statements. I see. To get back to my guesses, if she knew where he was all the time and was getting money from him, then why did his first wife finally come to see her husband? Perhaps because... I think I can help you there, Richmond interrupted. A fortunate investment in lumber nearly doubled Dr. Essep's wealth two or three months ago. That's it, then. She learned of it through Ledwich. She demanded, either through Ledwich or by letter, a rather large share of it, more than the doctor was willing to give. When he refused, she came to see him in person to demand the money under threat, we'll say, of instant exposure. He thought she was in earnest. Either he couldn't raise the money she demanded, or he was tired of living a double life. Anyway, he thought it all over and decided to commit suicide. This is all a guess or a series of guesses, but it sounds reasonable to me. To me, too, the attorney said. What are you going to do now? I'm still having both of them shadowed. There's no other way of tackling them just now. I'm having the woman looked up in Louisville, but you understand, I might dig up a whole flock of things on them, and when I got through, still be as far as ever from finding the letter Dr. Estep wrote before he died. There are plenty of reasons for thinking that the woman destroyed the letter. That would have been her wisest play. But if I can get enough on her, even at that, I can squeeze her into admitting that the letter was written and that it said something about suicide, if it did and that will be enough to spring your client. How is she today? Any better? His thin face lost the animation that had come to it during our discussion of Ledwich and became bleak. She went completely to pieces last night and was removed to the hospital where she should have been taken in the first place. To tell you the truth, if she isn't liberated soon, she won't need our help. I've done my utmost to have her released on bail, pulled every wire I know, but there's little likelihood of success in that direction. Knowing that she is a prisoner, charged with murdering her husband, is killing her. She isn't young, and she has always been subject to nervous disorders. The bare shock of her husband's death was enough to prostrate her, but now you've got to get her out, and quickly— he was striding up and down his office, his voice throbbing with feeling. I left quickly. Chapter 6 From the attorney's office I returned to the agency, where I was told that Bob Teal had phoned in the address of a furnished apartment he had rented on Laguna Street. I hopped on a streetcar and went up to take a look at it. But I didn't get that far. Walking down Laguna Street after leaving the car, I spied Bob Teal coming toward me. Between Bob and me, also coming toward me, was a big man whom I recognized as Jacob Ledwich, a big man with a big red face around a tiny mouth. I walked on down the street, passing both Ledwich and Bob, without paying any apparent attention to either. At the next corner I stopped to roll a cigarette and steal a look at the pair. And then I came to life. Ledwich had stopped at a vestibule cigar stand up the street to make a purchase. Bob Teal, knowing his stuff, had passed him and was walking steadily up the street. He was figuring that Ledwich had either come out for the purpose of buying cigars or cigarettes and would return to his flat with him, or that after making his purchase, the big man would proceed to the car line, where in either event, Bob would wait. But as Ledwich had stopped before the cigar stand, a man across the street had stepped suddenly into a doorway and stood there, back in the shadows. This man, I now remembered, had been on the opposite side of the street from Bob and Ledwich, and walking in the same direction. 
he too was following Ledwich. By the time Ledwich had finished his business at the stand, Bob had reached Sutter Street, the nearest car line. Ledwich started up the street in that direction. The man in the doorway stepped out and went after him. I followed that one. A ferry-bound car came down Sutter Street just as I reached the corner. Ledwich and I got aboard together. The mysterious stranger fumbled with a shoestring several pavements from the corner until the car was moving again, and then he likewise made a dash for it. He stood beside me on the rear platform, hiding behind a large man in overalls, past whose shoulder he now and then peeped at Ledwich. Bob had gone to the corner above and was already seated, when Ledwich, this amateur detective, there was no doubting his amateur status, and I got on the car. I sized up the amateur while he strained his neck peeping at Ledwich. He was small, this sleuth, and scrawny and frail. His most noticeable feature was his nose, a limp organ that twitched nervously all the time. His clothes were old and shabby, and he himself was somewhere in his fifties. After studying him for a few minutes, I decided that he hadn't tumbled a Bob Teal's part in the game. His attention had been too firmly fixed upon Ledwich, and the distance had been too short thus far for him to discover that Bob was also tailing the big man. So when the seat beside Bob was vacated presently, I chucked my cigarette away, went into the car, and sat down, my back toward the little man with the twitching nose. Drop off after a couple of blocks and go back to the apartment. Don't shadow Ledwich any more until I tell you. Just watch his place. There's a bird following him, and I want to see what he's up to, I told Bob in an undertone. He grunted that he understood, and after a few minutes left the car. At Stockton Street, Ledwich got off, the man with the twitching nose behind him and me in the rear. In that formation, we paraded around town all afternoon. The big man had business in a number of pool rooms, cigar stores, and soft drink parlors, most of which I knew for places where you can get a bet down on any horse that's running in North America, whether at Tanferan, Tijuana, or Timonium. Just what Ledwich did in these places I didn't learn. I was bringing up the rear of the procession, and my interest was centered upon the mysterious little stranger. He didn't enter any of the places behind Ledwich, but loitered in their neighborhoods until Ledwich reappeared. He had a rather strenuous time of it, laboring mightily to keep out of Ludwich's sight, and only succeeding because we were downtown, where you can get away with almost any kind of shadowing. He certainly made a lot of work for himself, dodging here and there. After a while, Ludwich shook him. The big man came out of a cigar store with another man. They got into an automobile that was standing beside the curb and drove away, leaving my man standing on the edge of the sidewalk, twitching his nose in chagrin. There was a taxi stand just around the corner, but he either didn't know it or didn't have enough money to pay the fare. I expected him to return to Laguna Street then, but he didn't. He led me down Kearney Street to Portsmouth, where he stretched himself out on the grass, face down, lit a black pipe, and lay looking dejectedly at the Stevenson Monument, probably without seeing it. I sprawled on a comfortable piece of sod some distance away, between a Chinese woman with two perfectly round children and an ancient Portuguese in a gaily checkered suit, and we let the afternoon go by. When the sun had gone low enough for the ground to become chilly, the little man got up, shook himself, and went back up Kearney Street to a cheap lunch room, where he ate meagerly. Then he entered a hotel a few doors away, took a key from the row of hooks, and vanished down a dark corridor. Running through the register, I found that the key he had taken belonged to a room whose occupant was John Boyd, St. Louis, Missouri, and that he had arrived the day before. This hotel wasn't of the sort where it's safe to make inquiries, so I went down to the street again and came to rest on the least conspicuous nearby corner. Twilight came, and the street and shop lights were turned on. It got dark, the night traffic of Kearney Street went up and down past me. Filipino boys in their two dapper clothes, bound for the inevitable blackjack game. Gaudy women, still heavy-eyed from their day's sleep. Plainclothes men on their way to headquarters to report before going off duty. Chinese going to or from Chinatown. Sailors in pairs looking for action of any sort. Hungry people making for the Italian and French restaurants. 
worried people going into the bail bond broker's office on the corner to arrange for the release of friends and relatives whom the police had nabbed, Italians on their homeward journeys from work, odds and ends of furtive-looking citizens on various shady errands. Midnight came, and no John Boyd, and I called it a day and went home. Before going to bed, I talked with Dick Foley over the wire. He said that Mrs. Estep had done nothing of any importance all day and had received neither mail nor phone calls. I told him to stop shadowing her until I solved John Boyd's game. I was afraid Boyd might turn his attention to the woman, and I didn't want him to discover that she was being shadowed. I had already instructed Bob Teal to simply watch Ledwich's flat to see when he came in and went out and with whom, and now I told Dick to do the same with the woman. My guess on this Boyd person was that he and the woman were working together, that she had him watching Ledwich for her so that the big man couldn't double-cross her. But that was only a guess, and I don't gamble too much on my guesses. Chapter 7 the next morning I dressed myself up in an army shirt and shoes, an old faded cap, and a suit that wasn't downright ragged but was shabby enough not to stand out too noticeably beside John Boyd's old clothes. It was a little after nine o'clock when Boyd left his hotel and had breakfast at the grease joint where he had eaten the night before. Then he went up to Laguna Street, picked himself a corner, and waited for Jacob Ledwich. He did a lot of waiting. He waited all day, because Ledwich didn't show until after dark. But the little man was well stocked with patience. I'll say that for him. He fidgeted and stood on one foot and then the other, and then even tried sitting on the curb for a while, but he stuck it out. I took it easy myself. The furnished apartment Bob Teal had rented to watch Ledwich's flat from was a ground floor one across the street and just a little above the corner where Boyd waited, so we could watch him in the flat with one eye. Bob and I sat and smoked and talked all day, taking turns watching the fidgeting man on the corner and Ledwich's door. Night had just definitely settled when Ledwich came out and started up toward the car line. I slid out into the street and our parade was underway again, Ledwich leading, Boyd following him, and we following him. Half a block of this and I got an idea. I'm not what you call a brilliant thinker. Such results as I get, usually the fruits of patience, industry, and unimaginative plugging, helped out now and then maybe by a little luck. But I do have my flashes of intelligence, and this was one of them. Ledwich was about a block ahead of me, Boyd half that distance. Speeding up, I passed Boyd and caught up with Ledwich. Then I slackened my pace so as to walk beside him, though with no appearance from the rear of having any interest in him. "'Jake,' I said, without turning my head. "'There's a guy following you.' The big man almost spoiled my little scheme by stopping dead still, but he caught himself in time, and taking his cue from me, kept walking. "'Who the hell are you?' he growled. "'Don't get funny,' I snapped back, still looking and walking ahead. "'It ain't my funeral. But I was coming up the street when you came out, and I seen this guy duck behind a pole until you was passed, and then follow you up. That got him. You sure? Sure. All you got to do to prove it is to turn the next corner and wait. I was two or three steps ahead of him by this time. I turned the corner and halted, with my back against the brick building front. Ledwich took up the same position at my side. Want any help? I grinned at him, a reckless sort of grin, unless my acting was poor. No. His little lumpy mouth was set ugly, and his blue eyes were hard as pebbles. I flicked the tail of my coat aside to show him the butt of my gun. Want to borrow the rod? I asked. No. He was trying to figure me out in small wonder. Don't mind if I stick around to see the fun, do you? I asked mockingly. There wasn't time for him to answer that. Boyd had quickened his steps, and now he came hurrying around the corner, his nose twitching like a tracking dog's. Ledwich stepped into the middle of the sidewalk, so suddenly that the little man thudded into him with a grunt. For a moment they stared at each other, and there was recognition between them. Ledwich shot one big hand out and clamped the other by his shoulder. "'What are you snooping around me for, you rat? Didn't I tell you to keep away from Frisco?' "'Ah, Jake!' 
Boyd begged. I didn't mean no harm. I just thought that... Ludwich silenced him with a shake that clicked his mouth shut and turned to me. A friend of mine, he sneered. His eyes grew suspicious and hard again and ran up and down me from cap to shoes. How do you know my name? he demanded. A famous man like you? I asked in burlesque astonishment. Never mind the comedy. He took a threatening step toward me. How'd you know my name? None of your damn business, I snapped. My attitude seemed to reassure him. His face became less suspicious. Well, he said slowly, I owe you something for this trick, and how are you fixed? I have been dirtier. Dirty is Pacific Coast Argot for prosperous. He looked speculative from me to Boyd and back. You know the circle? he asked me. I nodded. The underworld calls Wap Healy's joint the circle. If you'll meet me there tomorrow night, maybe I can put a piece of change your way. Nothing stirring, I shook my head with emphasis. I ain't circulating that prominent these days. A fat chance I'd have of meeting him there. Wap Healy and half his customers knew me as a detective. So there was nothing to do but to try to get the impression over that I was a crook who had reasons for wanting to keep away from the more notorious hangouts for a while. Apparently it got over. He thought for a while and then gave me his Laguna Street number. Drop in this time tomorrow. Maybe I'll have a proposition to make you, if you've got the guts. I'll think it over, I said noncommittally, and turned as if to go down the street. Just a minute, he called, and I faced him again. What's your name? Wisher, I said. Shine, if you want a front one. Shine Wisher, he repeated. I don't remember ever hearing it before. It would have surprised me if he had. I had made it up only about fifteen minutes before. You needn't yell it, I said sourly, so that everybody in the burg will remember hearing it. And with that I left him, not at all dissatisfied with myself. By tipping him off to Boyd, I had put him under obligations to me, and had led him to accept me at least tentatively as a fellow crook. And by making no apparent effort to gain his good graces, I had strengthened my hand that much more. I had a date with him for the next day, when I was to be given a chance to earn, illegally no doubt, a piece of change. There was a chance that this proposition that he had in view for me had nothing to do with the S-Step affair, but then again it might, and whether it did or not, I had my entering wedge at least a little way into Jake Ledwich's business. I strolled around for about half an hour, and then went back to Bob Teal's apartment. Ledwich come back? Yes, Bob said, with that little guy of yours. They went in about a half hour ago. Good. Haven't seen a woman go in. No. I expected to see the first Mrs. Estep arrive sometime during the evening, but she didn't. Bob and I sat around and talked and watched Ledwich's doorway, and the hours passed. At one o'clock, Ledwich came out alone. "'I'm going to tail him, just for luck,' Bob said, and caught up his cap. Ledwich vanished around a corner, and then Bob passed out of sight behind him. Five minutes later, Bob was with me again. "'He's getting his machine out of the garage.' I jumped for the telephone and put in a rush order for a fast touring car. Bob, at the window, called out, "'Here he is!' I joined Bob in time to see Ledwich going into his vestibule. His car stood in front of the house. A very few minutes, and Boyd and Ledwich came out together. Boyd was leaning heavily on Ledwich, who was supporting the little man with his arm across his back. We couldn't see their faces in the dark, but the little man was plainly either sick, drunk, or drugged. Ledwich helped his companion into the touring car, the red tail light laughed back at us for a few blocks and then disappeared. The automobile I had ordered arrived twenty minutes later, so we sent it back unused. A little after three that morning, Ledwich, alone and afoot, returned from the direction of his garage. He had been gone exactly two hours. End of Part One Zigzags of Treachery Part 2. Chapter 8. Neither Bob nor I went home that night, but slept in the Laguna Street apartment. Bob went down to the corner grocer's to get what we needed for breakfast in the morning, and he brought a morning paper back with him. 
I cooked breakfast while he divided his attention between Ledwich's front door and the newspaper. Hey, he called suddenly. Look here. I ran out of the kitchen with a handful of bacon. What is it? Listen, Park murder mystery, he read. Early this morning, the body of an unidentified man was found near a driveway in Golden Gate Park. His neck had been broken, according to the police, who said that the absence of any considerable bruises on the body, as well as the orderly condition of the clothes and the ground nearby, show that he did not come to his death through falling or being struck by an automobile. It is believed that he was killed and then carried to the park in an automobile to be left there. Boyd, I said. I bet you, Bob agreed. And at the morgue, a very little while later, we learned that we were correct. The dead man was John Boyd. He was dead when Ledwich brought him out of the house, Bob said. I nodded. He was. He was a little man, and it wouldn't have been much of a stunt for a big bruiser like Ledwich to have dragged him along with one arm the short distance from the door to the curb, pretending to be holding him up, like you do with a drunk. Let's go over to the Hall of Justice and see what the police have got on it, if anything. At the detective bureau, we hunted up O'Gar, the detective sergeant in charge of the homicide detail, and a good man to work with. The dead man found in the park, I asked. Know anything about him? O'Gar pushed back his village constable's hat, a big black hat with floppy brim that belonged in vaudeville, scratched his bullet head, and scowled at me as if he thought I had a joke up my sleeve. Not a damn thing, except that he's dead he said at last. How'd you like to know who he was last seen with? It wouldn't hinder me in any way in finding out who bumped him off, and that's a fact. How do you like the sound of this? I asked. His name was John Boyd, and he was living at a hotel down in the next block. The last person he was seen with was a guy who was tied up with Dr. Estep's first wife. You know, the Estep whose second wife is the woman you people are trying to prove a murder on? Does that sound interesting? He does, he said. Where do we go first? This Ledwich, he's the fellow who was last seen with Boyd, is going to be a hard bird to shake down. We better try to crack the woman first, the first Mrs. Estep. There's a chance that Boyd was a pal of hers, and in that case, when she finds out that Ledwich rubbed him out, she may open up and spill the works to us. On the other hand, if she and Ledwich are stacked up against Boyd together, then we might as well get her safely placed before we tie into him. I don't want to pull him in before night anyway. I got a date with him, and I want to try to rope him first. Bob Teal made for the door. I'm going up and keep my eye on him until you're ready for him, he called over his shoulder. Good, I said. Don't let him out of town on us. If he tries to blow, have him chucked in the can. In the lobby of the Montgomery Hotel, O'Gar and I talked to Dick Foley first. He told us that the woman was still in her room, had had her breakfast sent up. She had received neither letters, telegrams, nor phone calls since we began to watch her. I got a hold of Stacy again. We're going up to talk to this Estep woman, and maybe we'll take her away with us. Will you send up a maid to find out whether she's up and dressed yet? We don't want to announce ourselves ahead of time, and we don't want to burst in on her while she's still in bed or only partly dressed. He kept us waiting about fifteen minutes and then told us that Mrs. Estep was up and dressed. We went up to her room, taking the maid with us. The maid rapped on the door. What is it? an irritable voice demanded. The maid. I want to... The key turned on the inside, and an angry Mrs. Estep jerked the door open. O'Gar and I advanced, O'Gar flashing his buzzer. "'From headquarters,' he said. "'We want to talk to you.' O'Gar's foot was where she couldn't slam the door on us, and we were both walking ahead, so there was nothing for her to do but retreat into the room, admitting us, which she did with no pretense of graciousness. We closed the door, and then I threw our big load at her. "'Mrs. Estep, why did Jake Ledwich kill John Boyd?' The expressions ran over her face like this. Alarm at Ledwich's name. Fear at the word kill. But the name John Boyd brought only bewilderment. Why did what? She stammered meaninglessly to gain time. 
Exactly, I said. Why did Jake kill him last night in his flat and then take him in the park and leave him? Another set of expressions. Increased bewilderment until I had almost finished the sentence. And then the sudden understanding of something, followed by the inevitable groping for poise. These things weren't as plain as billboards, you understand, but they were there to be read by anyone who has ever played poker, either with cards or people. What I got out of them was that Boyd hadn't been working with or for her, and that though she knew Ledwich had killed somebody at some time, it wasn't Boyd, and it wasn't last night. Who then? And when? Dr. Estep? Hardly. There wasn't a chance in the world that if he had been murdered, anyone except his wife had done it, his second wife. No possible reading of the evidence could bring any other answer. Who then had Ledwich killed before Boyd? Was he a wholesale murderer? These things were flitting through my head in flashes and odd scraps while Mrs. Estep was saying, This is absurd. The idea of your coming up here and... She talked for five minutes straight, the words fairly sizzling from between her hard lips, but the words themselves didn't mean anything. She was talking for time, talking while she tried to hit upon the safest attitude to assume. And before we could head her off, she had hit upon it. Silence. We got not another word out of her, and that is the only way in the world to beat the grilling game. The average suspect tries to talk himself out of being arrested, and it doesn't matter how shrewd a man is or how good a liar, if he'll talk to you and you play your cards right, you can hook him, can make him help you convict him. But if he won't talk, you can't do a thing with him. And that's how it was with this woman. She refused to pay any attention to our questions. She wouldn't speak, nod, grunt, or wave an arm in reply. She gave us a fine assortment of facial expressions, true enough, but we wanted verbal information and we got none. We weren't easily licked, however. Three beautiful hours of it we gave her, without rest. We stormed, cajoled, threatened, and at times I think we danced, but it was no go. So in the end, we took her away with us. We didn't have anything on her, but we couldn't afford to have her running around loose until we nailed Ledwich. At the Hall of Justice, we didn't book her, but simply held her as a material witness putting her in an office with a matron and one of O'Gar's men, who were to see what they could do with her while we went after Ludwich. We had her frisked as soon as she reached the hall, of course, and as we expected, she hadn't a thing of importance on her. O'Gar and I went back to the Montgomery and gave her room a thorough overhauling, and found nothing. "'Are you sure you know what you're talking about?' the detective sergeant asked as we left the hotel. It's going to be a pretty joke on somebody, if you're mistaken. I let that go by without an answer. I'll meet you at 6.30, I said, and we'll go up against Ledwich. He grunted in approval, and I set out for Vance Richmond's office. Chapter 9 The attorney sprang up from his desk as soon as his stenographer admitted me. His face was leaner and grayer than ever. Its lines had deepened and there was a hollowness around his eyes. "'You've got to do something,' he cried huskily. "'I have just come from the hospital. Mrs. Estep is in the point of death. A day more of this, two days at the most, and she will—' I interrupted him and swiftly gave him an account of the day's happenings and what I expected or hoped to make out of them. But he received the news without brightening and shook his head hopelessly. But don't you see, he exclaimed when I had finished, that that won't do. I know you can find proof of her innocence in time. I'm not complaining. You've done all that could be expected and more. But all that's no good. I've got to have, well, a miracle, perhaps. Suppose that you do finally get the truth out of Ledwich and the first Mrs. Estep or it comes out during their trials for Boyd's murder, or that if you even get to the bottom of the matter in three or four days, that will be too late. If I can go to Mrs. Estep and tell her that she's free now, she may pull herself together and come through. But another day of imprisonment, two days, or perhaps even two hours, 
and she won't need anyone to clear her. Death will have done it. I tell you, she's... I left Vince Richmond abruptly again. The lawyer was bound upon getting me worked up, and I like my jobs to be simply jobs. Emotions are nuisances during business hours. Chapter 10 At a quarter to seven that evening, while Ogar remained down the street, I rang Jacob Ledwich's bell. As I had stayed with Bob Teal in our apartment the previous night, I was still wearing the clothes in which I had made Ledwidge's acquaintance as Shine Wisher. Ledwidge opened the door. Hello, Wisher, he said without enthusiasm, and led me upstairs. His flat consisted of four rooms, I found, running the full length and half the breadth of the building, with both front and rear exits. It was furnished with the ordinary none-too-spotless appointments of the typically moderately priced furnished flat alike the world over. In his front room, we sat down and talked and smoked and sized one another up. He seemed a little nervous. I thought he would have been just as well satisfied if I had forgotten to show up. About this job you mentioned, I asked presently. Sorry, he said, moistening his little lumpy mouth, but it's all off. And then he added, obviously as an afterthought, for the present, at least. I guessed from that my job was to have taken care of Boyd, but Boyd had been taken care of for good. He brought out some whiskey after a while, and we talked it over for some time, to no purpose whatever. He was trying not to appear too anxious to get rid of me, and I was cautiously feeling him out. Piecing together things he let fall here and there, I came to the conclusion that he was a former con man who had fallen into an easier game of late years, this was in line, too, with what Porky Grout had told Bob Teal. I talked about myself with the evasiveness that would have been natural to a crook in my situation and made one or two carefully planned slips that would lead him to believe that I had been tied up with the Jimmy the Riveter hold-up mob, most of whom were doing long hitches at Walla Walla then. He offered to lend me enough money to tide me over until I could get on my feet again. I told him I didn't need chicken feed so much as a chance to pick up some real jack. The evening was going along, and we were getting nowhere. Jake, I said casually, outwardly casual, that is. You took a big chance putting that guy out of the way like you did last night. I meant to stir things up, and I succeeded. His face went crazy. A gun came out of his coat. Firing from my pocket, I shot it out of his hand. Now behave, I ordered. He sat rubbing his benumbed hand and staring with wide eyes at the smoldering hole in my coat. Looks like a great stunt, this shooting a gun out of a man's hand, but it's a thing that happens now and then. A man who is a fair shot, and that's exactly what I am, no more, no less, naturally and automatically shoots pretty close to the spot upon which his eyes are focused. When a man goes for his gun in front of you, you shoot at him, not at any particular part of him. There isn't time for that. You shoot at him. However, you're more than likely to be looking at his gun, and in that case it isn't altogether surprising if your bullet should hit his gun, as mine had done. But it looks impressive. I beat out the fire around the bullet hole in my coat, crossed the room to where his revolver had been knocked, and picked it up. I started to eject the bullets from it, but instead I snapped it shut again and stuck it in my pocket. Then I retreated to my chair opposite him. A man oughtn't to act like that, I kidded him. He's likely to hurt somebody. His little mouth curled up at me. An elbow, huh? Putting all the contempt he could in his voice. And somehow any synonym for detective seems to hold a lot of contempt. I might have tried to talk myself back into the wisher role. Could have been done, but I doubted that it would be worth it, so I nodded my confession. His brain was working now, and the passion left his face while he sat rubbing his right hand, and his little mouth and eyes began to screw themselves up calculatingly. I kept quiet, waiting to see what the outcome of his thinking would be. I knew he was trying to figure out just what my place in this game was, since to his knowledge I had come into it no later than the previous evening, then the Boyd murder hadn't brought me in. That would leave the Estep affair, 
unless he was tied up in a lot of other crooked stuff that I didn't know anything about. You're not a city dick, are you? he asked finally. And his voice was on the verge of friendliness now, the voice of one who wants to persuade you of something or sell you something. The truth, I thought, wouldn't hurt. No, I said. I'm with the Continental. He itched his chair a little closer to the muzzle of my automatic. What are you after, then? Where do you come in on it? I tried the truth again. The second Mrs. Estep. She didn't kill her husband. You're trying to dig up enough dope to spring her? Yes. I waved him back as he tried to hitch his chair still nearer. How do you expect to do it? He asked, his voice going lower and more confidential with each word. I took still another flyer at the truth. He wrote a letter before he died. Well? But I called a halt for the time. Just that, I said. He leaned back in his chair, and his eyes and mouth grew small in thought again. What's your interest in the man who died last night? He asked slowly. It's something on you, I said truthfully again. It doesn't do the second Mrs. Estep any direct good, maybe, but you and the first wife are stacked up together against her. Anything, therefore, that hurts you two will help her, somehow. I admit I'm wandering around in the dark, but I'm going ahead whenever I see a point of light, and I'll come through to daylight in the end. Nailing you for Boyd's murder is one point of light. He leaned forward suddenly, his eyes and mouth popping open as far as they would go. You'll come out all right, he said very softly, if you use a little judgment. What's that supposed to mean? Do you think, he asked still very softly, that you can nail me for Boyd's murder? That you can convict me of murder? I do. But I wasn't any too sure. In the first place, though we were morally certain of it, neither Bob Teal nor I could swear that the man who had gotten in the machine with Ledwich was John Boyd. We knew it was, of course, but the point is that it had been too dark for us to see his face, and again in the dark we had thought him alive. It wasn't until later that we knew he had been dead when he came down the steps. Little things, those, but a private detective on the witness stand, unless he is absolutely sure of every detail, has an unpleasant and ineffectual time of it. I do, I repeated, thinking these things over, and I'm satisfied to go to the bat with what I've got on you and what I can collect between now and the time you and your accomplice go to trial. Accomplice? he said, not very surprised. That would be Edna. I suppose you've already grabbed her. Yes, he laughed. <laughs> You'll have one sweet time getting anything out of her. In the first place, she doesn't know much, and in the second, well, I suppose you've tried and have found what a helpful sort she is, so don't try the old gag of pretending that she has talked. I'm not pretending anything. Silence between us for a few seconds, and then, I'm going to make you a proposition, he said. You can take it or leave it. The note Dr. Estep wrote before he died was to me, and it is positive proof that he committed suicide. Give me a chance to get away, just a chance, a half-hour start, and I'll give you my word of honor to send you the letter. I know I can trust you, I said sarcastically. I'll trust you, then, he shot back at me. I'll turn the note over to you if you'll give me your word that I'm to have half an hour's start. For what? I demanded. Why shouldn't I take both you and the note? <laughs> if you can get them. But do I look like the kind of sap who would leave the note where it could be found? You think it's here in the room, maybe? I didn't. But neither did I think because he had hidden it, it couldn't be found. I can't think of any reason why I should bargain with you, I told him. I've got you cold, and that's enough. If I can show you that your only chance of freeing the second Mrs. Estep is through my voluntary assistance, will you bargain with me? Maybe. I'll listen to your persuasion, anyway. All right, he said. I'm going to come clean with you. But most of the things I'm going to tell you can't be proven in court without my help. And if you turn my offer down, 
I'll have plenty of evidence to convince the jury that these things are all false, that I never said them, and that you are trying to frame me. That part was plausible enough. I've testified before juries all the way from the city of Washington to the state of Washington, and I've never seen one that wasn't anxious to believe that a private detective is a double-crossing specialist who goes around with a cold deck in one pocket, a complete forger's outfit in another, and who counts that day lost in which he railroads no innocent to the Hooskow. Chapter 11 there was once a young doctor in a town a long way from here, Ludwich began. He got mixed up in a scandal, a pretty rotten one, and escaped the pen only by the skin of his teeth. The state medical board revoked his license. In a large city not far away, this young doc, one night when he was drunk, as he usually was in those days, told his troubles to a man he had met in a dive. The friend was a resourceful sort, and he offered, for a price, to fix the doc up with a fake diploma so he could set up in practice in some other state. The young doctor took him up, and the friend got the diploma for him. The doc was the man you know as Dr. Estep, and I was the friend. The real Dr. Estep was found dead in a park this morning. That was news, if true. You see... The big man went on. When I offered to get the phony diploma for the young doc, whose real name doesn't matter, I had in mind a forged one. Nowadays they're easy to get. There's a regular business in them. But twenty-five years ago, while you could manage it, they were hard to get. While I was trying to get one, I ran across a woman I used to work with, Edna Fife. That's the woman you know as the first Mrs. Estep. Edna had married a doctor, the real Humbert Estep. He was a hell of a doctor, though, and after starving with him in Philadelphia for a couple of years, she made him close up his office, and she went back to the bunco game, taking him with her. She was good at it, I'm telling you, a real cleaner, and keeping him under her thumb all the time, she made him a pretty good worker himself. It was shortly after that that I met her, and when she told me all this, I offered to buy her husband's medical diploma and other credentials. I don't know whether he wanted to sell them or not, but he did what she told him, and I got the papers. I turned them over to the young doc, who came to San Francisco and opened an office under the name of Humbert Estep. The real Esteps promised not to use that name any more. Not much of an inconvenience for them, as they changed names every time they had changed addresses. I kept in touch with the young doctor, of course, getting my regular rake off from him. I had him by the neck, and I wasn't foolish enough to pass up any easy money. After a year or so, I learned that he had pulled himself together and was making good. So I jumped on a train and came to San Francisco. He was doing fine, so I camped here, or I could keep my eye on him and watch out for my own interests. He got married about then, and between his practice and his investments, he began to accumulate a roll. But he tightened up on me, damn him. He wouldn't be bled. I got a regular percentage of what he made, and that was all. For nearly twenty-five years I got it, but not a nickel over the percentage. He knew I wouldn't kill the goose that laid the golden eggs, so no matter how much I threatened to expose him, he sat tight. And I couldn't budge him. I got my regular cut, not a nickel more. That went along, as I say, for years. I was getting a living out of him, but I wasn't getting any big money. A few months ago, I learned that he'd cleaned up heavily in a lumber deal, so I made up my mind to take him for what he had. During all these years, I'd got to know the doc pretty well. You do when you're bleeding a man. You get a pretty fair idea of what goes on in his head and what he's most likely to do if certain things should happen. So I knew the doc pretty well. I knew, for instance, that he had never told his wife the truth about his past, that he had stalled her with some lie about being born in West Virginia. That was fine for me. Then I knew he kept a gun in his desk, and I knew why. It was kept there for the purpose of killing himself if the truth ever came out about his diploma. 
He figured that if at the first hint of exposure he wiped himself out, the authorities, out of respect for the good reputation he had built up, would hush things up. And his wife, even if she herself learned the truth, would be spared the shame of a public scandal. I can't see myself dying just to spare some woman's feelings, but the doc was a funny guy in some ways, and he was nutty about his wife. That's the way I had him figured out. That's the way things turned out. My plan might sound complicated, but it was simple enough. I got hold of the real S-steps. It took a lot of hunting, but I found them at last. I brought the woman to San Francisco and told the man to stay away. Everything would have gone fine if he had done what I told him, but he was afraid that Edna and I were going to double-cross him, so he came here to keep an eye on us. But I didn't know that until you put the finger on him for me. I brought Edna here, and without telling her any more than she had to know, drilled her until she was letter perfect in her part. A couple of days before she came, I had gone to see the doc, and it demanded a hundred thousand cool smacks. He laughed at me, and I left, pretending to be as hot as hell. As soon as Edna arrived, I sent her to call on him. She asked him to perform an illegal operation on her daughter. He, of course, refused. Then she pleaded with him, loud enough for the nurse or whoever was in the reception room to hear. And when she raised her voice, she was careful to stick to words that could be interpreted in the way we wanted them to. She ran off her end to perfection, leaving in tears. Then I sprang my other trick. I had a fellow, a fellow who's a whiz at that sort of stuff, make me a plate, an imitation of newspaper printing. It was all worded like the real article and said that the state authorities were investigating information that a prominent surgeon in San Francisco was practicing under a license secured by false credentials. This plate measured four and an eighth by six and three quarters inches. If you look at the first inside page of the Evening Times any day in the week, you'll see a photograph just that size. On the day after Edna's call, I bought a copy of the first edition of the Times, on the street at ten in the morning. I had this scratcher friend of mine remove the photograph with acid and print this fake article in its place. That evening I substituted a home edition outer sheet for the one that had come with the paper we had cooked up and made a switch as soon as the doc's newsboy made his delivery. There was nothing to that part of it. The kid just tossed the paper into the vestibule. It's simply a case of duck into the doorway, trade papers, and go on, leaving the loaded one for the doc to read. I was trying not to look too interested, but my ears were cocked for every word. At the start, I had been prepared for a string of lies, but I knew now he was telling me the truth. Every syllable was a boast. He was half drunk with appreciation of his own cleverness, the cleverness with which he had planned and carried out his program of treachery and murder. I knew he was telling the truth, and I suspected that he was telling more of it than he had intended. He was fairly bloated with vanity, the vanity that fills the crook almost invariably after a little success and makes him ripe for the pen. His eyes glistened, and his little mouth smiled triumphantly around the words that continued to roll out of it. The doc read the paper, all right and shot himself, but first he wrote and mailed a note to me. I didn't figure on his wife's being accused of killing him. That was plain luck. I figured that the fake piece of the paper would be overlooked in the excitement. Edna would then go forward, claiming to be his first wife, and in shooting himself after her first call with what the nurse had overheard would make his death seem a confession that Edna was his wife. I was sure that she would stand up under any sort of investigation. Nobody knew anything about the doc's real past except what he had told them, which would be found false. Edna had really married a Dr. Humbert Estep in Philadelphia in 96, and the 27 years that had passed since then would do a lot to hide the fact that Dr. Humbert Estep wasn't this Dr. Humbert Estep. All I wanted to do was convince the doc's real wife and her lawyers that she wasn't really his wife at all. And we did that. Everybody took it for granted that Edna was the legal wife. The next play 
would have been for Edna and the real wife to have reached some sort of an agreement about the estate, whereby Edna would have gotten the bulk, or at least half of it, and nothing would have been made public. If worst came to worst, we were prepared to go to court. We were sitting pretty. But I'd have been satisfied with half the estate. It would have come to a few hundred thousand at the least, and that would have been plenty for me, even deducting the twenty thousand I had promised Edna. But when the police grabbed the doc's wife and charged her with his murder, I saw my way into the whole role. All I had to do was sit tight, wait until I convicted her. Then the court would turn the entire pile over to Edna. I had the only evidence that would free the doc's wife, the note that he had written me. But I couldn't, even if I'd wanted to, have turned it in without exposing my hand. When he read that fake piece in the paper, he tore it out, wrote his message to me across the face of it, and sent it to me. So the note is a dead giveaway. However, I didn't have any intention of publishing it anyhow. Up to this point, everything had gone like a dream. All I had to do was wait until it was time to cash in on my brains. And that's the time that the real Humbert Estep picked out to mess up the works. He shaved his mustache off, put on some old clothes, and came snooping around to see that Edna and I didn't run out on him, as if he could have stopped us. After you put the finger on him for me, I brought him up here. I intended solving him along until I could find a place to keep him until all the cards had been played. That's what I was going to hire you for, to take care of him. But we got to talking and wrangling, and I had to knock him down. He didn't get up. And then I found he was dead. His neck was broken. There was nothing to do but take him out to the park and leave him. I didn't tell Edna. She didn't have a lot of use for him, as far as I could see, but you can't tell how women will take things. Anyhow, she'll stick now that it's done. She's on the up and up all the time, and if she should talk, she can't do a lot of damage. She only knows her own part of the lay. All this long-winded story is so you'll know just exactly what you're up against. Maybe you think you can dig up the proof of these things I've told you. You can this far. You can prove that Edna wasn't the doc's wife. You can prove that I've been blackmailing him. But you can't prove that the doc's wife didn't believe that Edna was his real wife. It's her word against Edna's and mine. We'll swear we had convinced her of it, which will give her a motive. You can't prove that the phony news article I told you about ever existed. It'll sound like a hophead's dream to a jury. You can't tie last night's murder on me. I've got an alibi that will knock your hat off. I can prove that I left here with a friend of mine who was drunk and that I took him to his hotel and put him to bed with the help of a night clerk and a bellboy. And what do you got against that? The word of two private detectives. Who will believe you? You can convict me of conspiracy to defraud or something, maybe. But regardless of that, you can't free Mrs. Estep without my help. Turn me loose and I'll give you the letter the doc wrote me. It's the goods, right enough, in his own handwriting, written across the face of the fake newspaper story, which ought to fit the torn place in the paper that the police are supposed to be holding. And he wrote that he was going to kill himself, in words almost that plain. That would turn the trick, there was no doubt of it. And I believed Ledwich's story. The more I thought it over, the better I liked it. It fitted into the facts everywhere but I wasn't enthusiastic about giving this big crook his liberty. Don't make me laugh, I said. I'm going to put you away and free Mrs. Estep both. Go ahead and try it. You're up against it without the letter, and you don't think a man with brains enough to plan a job like this one would be foolish enough to leave the note where it could be found, do you? I wasn't especially impressed with the difficulty of convicting this Ledwich and freeing the dead man's widow. His scheme, that cold-blooded zigzag of treachery for everybody he had dealt with, including his latest accomplice, Edna Estep, wasn't as airtight as he thought it. A week in which to run out a few lines in the East, and... But a week was just what I didn't have. Vance Richmond's words were running through my head. But another day of imprisonment! 
two days, or perhaps even two hours, and she won't need anyone to clear her. Death will have done it. If I was going to do Mrs. Estep any good, I had to move quick, law or no law. Her life was in my fat hands. This man before me, his eyes bright and hopeful now, and his mouth anxiously pursed, was thief, blackmailer, double-crosser, and at least twice a murderer. I hated to let him walk out. But there was the woman dying in a hospital. Chapter 12 Keeping my eye on Ledwich, I went to the telephone and got Vance Richmond on the wire at his residence. "'How is Mrs. Estep?' I asked. "'Weaker. I talked with the doctor half an hour ago, and he says—' I cut in on him. I didn't want to listen to the details. "'Get over to the hospital and be where I can reach you by phone. I may have news for you before the night is over.' "'What? Is there a chance? Are you—' I didn't promise him anything.' I hung up the receiver and spoke to Ledwich. "'I'll do this much for you. Slip me the note, and I'll give you your gun and put you out the back door. There's a bull on the corner out front, and I can't take you past him.' He was on his feet, beaming. "'Your word on it?' he demanded. "'Yes. Get going.' He went past me to the phone, gave a number, which I made a note of, and then spoke hurriedly into the instrument. "'This is Schuler.' Put a boy in a taxi with the envelope I gave you to hold for me and send him out here right away. He gave his address, said yes twice, and hung up. There was nothing surprising about his unquestioning acceptance of my word. He couldn't afford to doubt that I'd play fair with him. And also, all successful bunco men come in time to believe that the world, except for themselves, is populated by a race of human sheep who may be trusted to conduct themselves with true sheep-like docility. Ten minutes later, the doorbell rang. We answered it together, and Ledwich took a large envelope from a messenger boy while I memorized the number on the boy's cap. Then we went back to the front room. Ledwich slit the envelope and passed its contents to me, a piece of rough-torn newspaper. Across the face of the fake article he had told me about was written a message in a jerky hand. I wouldn't have suspected you, Ledwich, of such profound stupidity. My last thought will be, this bullet that ends my life also ends your years of leisure. You'll have to go to work now. Estep. The doctor had died game. I took the envelope from the big man, put the death note in it, and put them in my pocket. Then I went to a front window, flattening a cheek against the glass until I could see O'Gar, dimly outlined in the night, patiently standing where I had left him hours before. The city dick is still on the corner, I told Ledwich. Here's your gat, holding out the gun I had shot from his fingers a little while back. Take it and blow through the back door. Remember, that's all I'm offering you, the gun and a fair start. If you play square with me, I'll not do anything to help find you, unless I have to keep myself in the clear. Fair enough. He grabbed the gun, broke it to see it was still loaded, and wheeled toward the rear of the flat. At the door, he pulled up hesitated, and faced me again. I kept him covered with my automatic. "'Will you do me one favor I didn't put in the bargain?' he asked. "'What is it?' "'That note of the docks is in an envelope with my handwriting and maybe my fingerprints on it. Let me put it in a fresh envelope, will you? I don't want to leave any broader trail behind than I have to.' With my left hand, my right being busy with a gun, I fumbled for the envelope and tossed it to him. He took a plain envelope from the table, wiped it carefully with his handkerchief, put the note in it, taking care not to touch it with the balls of his fingers, and passed it back to me, and I put it in my pocket. I had a hard time to keep from grinning in his face. That fumbling with the handkerchief told me that the envelope in my pocket was empty, that the death note was in Ledwich's possession, though I hadn't seen it pass there. He had worked one of his bunco tricks upon me. Beat it! I snapped, to keep from laughing in his face. He spun on his heel. His feet pounded against the floor. A door slammed in the rear. I tore into the envelope he had given me. I needed to be sure that he had double-crossed me. The envelope was empty. Our agreement was wiped out. I sprang to the front window, threw it wide open, and leaned out. O'Gar saw me immediately, clearer than I could see him. I swung my arm in a wide gesture toward the rear of the house. O'Gar set out for the alley on the run. 
I dashed back through Ledwich's flat to the kitchen and stuck my head out of an already open window. I could see Ledwich against the whitewashed fence, throwing the back gate open, plunging through it into the alley. Ogar's squat bulk appeared under a light at the end of the alley. Ledwich's revolver was in his hand. Ogar's wasn't, not quite. Ledwich's gun swung up. The hammer clicked. Ogar's gun coughed fire. Ledwich fell with a slow, revolving motion over against the white fence, gasped once or twice, and went down in a pile. I walked slowly down the stairs to join Ogar, slowly, because it isn't a nice thing to look at a man you've deliberately sent to his death, not even if it's the surest way of saving an innocent life, and if the man who dies is a Jake Ledwich, altogether treacherous. How come? Ogar asked when I came into the alley where he stood looking down at the dead man. He got out on me, I said simply. He must have. I stooped down and searched the dead man's pockets till I found the suicide note still crumpled in the handkerchief. Ogar was examining the dead man's revolver. Look it, he exclaimed. Maybe this ain't my lucky day. He stopped at me once in the gun mist fire. No wonder. Somebody must have been using an axe on it. The firing pins broke clean off. Is that so? I asked just as if I hadn't discovered, when I first picked the revolver up, that the bullet which had knocked it out of Ludwich's hand had made it harmless. End of Zigzags of Treachery, Part 2 The Girl with the Silver Eyes, Part 1 1. A bell jangled me into wakefulness. I rolled to the edge of my bed and reached for the telephone. The neat voice of the old man, the Continental Detective Agency's San Francisco manager, came to my ears. Sorry to disturb you, but you'll have to go up to the Glinton Apartments on Leavenworth Street. A man named Burke Pangburn, who lives there, phoned me a few minutes ago, asking to have someone sent up to see him at once. He seemed rather excited. Will you take care of it? See what he wants. I said I would, and yawning, stretching, and cursing Pangburn, whoever he was, got my fat body out of pajamas and into street clothes. The man who had disturbed my Sunday morning sleep, I found when I reached the Glenton, was a slim, white-faced person of about twenty-five, with big brown eyes that were red-rimmed just now from either sleeplessness or crying, or both, his long brown hair was rumpled when he opened the door to admit me, and he wore a mauve dressing robe spotted with big jade parrots over wine-colored silk pajamas. The room into which he led me resembled an auctioneer's establishment just before the sale, or maybe one of those alley tea rooms. Fat blue vases, crooked red vases, lanky yellow vases, vases of various shapes and colors, Marble statuettes, ebony statuettes, statuettes of any material, lanterns, lamps, and candlesticks, draperies, hangings, and rugs of all sorts, odds and ends of furniture that were all somehow queerly designed, peculiar pictures hung here and there in unexpected places. A hard room to feel comfortable in. My fiance, he began immediately in a high pitched voice that was within a notch of hysteria, has disappeared. Something has happened to her, foul play of some horrible sort. I want you to find her, to save her from this terrible thing that... I followed him this far and gave it up. A jumble of words came out of his mouth. Spirited away, mysterious something, lured into a trap. But they were too disconnected for me to make anything out of them. So I stopped trying to understand him and waited for him to babble himself empty of words. I have heard ordinarily reasonable men, under stress of excitement, run on even more crazily than this wild-eyed youth, but his dress, the parroted robe and gay pajamas, and his surroundings, this deliriously furnished room, gave him too theatrical a setting, made his words sound utterly unreal. He himself, when normal, should have been a rather nice-looking lad. His features were well-spaced and though his mouth and chin were a little uncertain, his broad forehead was good. 
But standing there listening to the occasional melodramatic phrase that I could pick out of the jumbled noises he was throwing at me, I thought that instead of parrots on his robe, he should have had cuckoos. Presently he ran out of language and was holding his long, thin hands out to me in an appealing gesture, saying, "'Will you?' over and over. "'Will you? Will you?' I nodded soothingly and noticed that tears were on his thin cheeks. "'Suppose we begin at the beginning,' I suggested, sitting down carefully on a carved bench of fairy that didn't look any too strong. "'Yes, yes,' he was standing legs apart in front of me, running his fingers through his hair. "'The beginning. I had a letter from her every day until—' "'That's not the beginning,' I objected. "'Who is she? What is she?' "'She's Jeanie Delano,' he exclaimed in surprise at my ignorance. "'And she is my fiance. and now she is gone, and I know that—' The phrases, victim of foul play, into a trap, and so on, began to flow hysterically out again. Finally, I got him quieted down, and sandwiched in between occasional emotional outbursts, got a story out of him that amounted to this. This Burke Pangburn was a poet— about two months before, he had received a note from a genie Delano, forwarded from his publishers, praising his latest book of rhymes. Jeanie Delano happened to live in San Francisco, too, though she hadn't known that he did. He had answered her note and had received another. After a little of this, they met. If she really was as beautiful as he claimed, then he wasn't to be blamed for falling in love with her. But whether or not she was really beautiful, he thought she was, and he had fallen hard. This Delano girl had been living in San Francisco for only a little while, and when the poet met her, she was living alone in an Ashbury Avenue apartment. He did not know where she came from or anything about her former life. He suspected from certain indefinite suggestions and peculiarities of conduct, which he couldn't put into words, that there was a cloud of some sort hanging over the girl that neither her past nor her present were free from difficulties. But he hadn't the least idea what those difficulties might be. He hadn't cared. He knew absolutely nothing about her, except that she was beautiful, and he loved her, and she had promised to marry him. Then, on the third of the month, exactly twenty-one days before this Sunday morning, the girl had suddenly left San Francisco. He had received a note from her by messenger. This note which he showed me after I had insisted point-blank on seeing it, read, Burke, love, have just received a wire and must go east on next train. Tried to get you on the phone, but couldn't. Will write you as soon as I know what my address will be, if anything. These two words were erased and could be read only with great difficulty. Love me until I am back with you forever. Your genie. Nine days later, he had received another letter from her from Baltimore, Maryland. This one, which I had a still harder time getting to look at, read, Dearest Poet, It seems like two years since I have seen you, and I have a fear that it's going to be between one and two months before I see you again. I can't tell you now, beloved, about what brought me here. There are things that can't be written. But as soon as I am back with you, I shall tell you the whole wretched story. If anything should happen, I mean to me, you'll go on loving me forever, won't you, beloved? But that's foolish. Nothing is going to happen. I'm just off the train and tired from traveling. Tomorrow I shall write you a long, long letter to make up for this. My address here is 215 North Stricker Street. Please, mister, at least one letter a day. Your own, Jeanie. For nine days he had had a letter from her each day, with two on Monday to make up for the none on Sunday. And then her letters had stopped, and the daily letters he had sent to the address she gave, 215 North Stricker Street, had begun to come back to him, marked Not Known. He had sent a telegram, and the telegraph company had informed him that its Baltimore office had been unable to find a genie Delano at the North Stricker Street address. For three days he had waited, expecting hourly to hear from the girl, and no word had come. Then he had bought a ticket for Baltimore. But, he wound up, I was afraid to go. I know she's in some sort of trouble. I can feel that. But I'm a silly poet. I can't deal with mysteries. Either I would find nothing at all, 
or if by luck I did stumble on the right track, the probabilities are that I would only muddle things, add fresh complications, perhaps endanger her life still further. I can't go blundering at it in that fashion without knowing whether I'm helping or harming her. It's a task for an expert in that sort of thing. So I thought of your agency. You'll be careful, won't you? It may be I don't know that she won't want assistance. It may be that you can help her without her knowing anything about it. You are accustomed to that sort of thing. You can do it, can't you? 2. I turned the job over and over in my mind before answering him. The two great bugaboos of a reputable detective agency are the persons who bring in a crooked plan or a piece of divorce work, all dressed up in the garb of a legitimate operation, and the irresponsible person who is laboring under wild and fanciful delusions, who wants a dream run out. This poet, sitting opposite me now, twining his long white fingers nervously together, was, I thought, sincere, but I wasn't so sure of his sanity. Mr. Pangburn, I said after a while, I'd like to handle this thing for you, but I'm not sure that I can. The Continental is rather strict. And while I believe this thing is on the level, still I'm only a hired man and have to go by the rules. Now, if you could give us the endorsement of some firm or person of standing, a reputable lawyer, for instance, or any legally responsible party, we'd be glad to go ahead with the work. Otherwise, I am afraid... But I know she's in danger, he broke out. I know that, and I can't be advertising her plight, airing her affairs to everyone. I'm sorry, but I can't touch it unless you can give me some such endorsement, I stood up. But you can find plenty of detective agencies that aren't so particular. His mouth worked like a small boy's, and he caught his lower lip between his teeth. For a moment I thought he was going to burst into tears, but instead he said slowly, I dare say you are right. Suppose I refer you to my brother-in-law, Roy Axford. Will his word be sufficient? Yes. Roy Axford, R. F. Axford, was a mining man who had a finger in at least half of the big business enterprises of the Pacific Coast, and his word on anything was commonly considered good enough for anybody. If you can get in touch with him now, I said, and arrange for me to see him today, I can get started without much delay. Pangburn crossed the room and dug a telephone out from among a heap of his ornaments. Within a minute or two he was talking to someone who he called Rita. Is Roy home? Will he be home this afternoon? No, you can give him a message for me, though. Tell him I'm sending a gentleman up to see him this afternoon on a personal matter, personal with me, and that I'll be very grateful if he'll do what I want. Yes. You'll find out, Rita. It isn't a thing to talk about over the phone. Yes, thanks. He pushed the telephone back into its hiding place and turned to me. He'll be at home until two o'clock. Tell him what I told you, and if he seems doubtful, have him call me up. You'll have to tell him the whole thing. He doesn't know anything at all about Miss Delano. All right. Before I go, I want a description of her. She's beautiful, he exclaimed. The most beautiful woman in the world. That would look nice on a reward circular. That isn't exactly what I want, I told him. How old is she? Twenty-two. Height? About five feet eight inches, or possibly nine. Slender, medium, or plump? She's inclined towards slenderness, but she... There was a note of enthusiasm in his voice that made me fear he was about to make a speech, so I cut him off with another question. What color hair? Brown. So dark it's almost black, and it's soft and thick and... Yes, yes, long or bobbed. Long and thick and... What color eyes? You've seen shadows on polished silver when... I wrote down gray eyes and hurried on with the interrogation. Complexion? Perfect. Uh-huh. But is it light or dark or florid or sallow or what? Fair. Face oval or square or long and thin or what shape? Oval. What shape nose? Large? Small? Turned up? 
small and regular. There was a touch of indignation in his voice. How did she dress? Fashionably? And did she favor bright or quiet colors? Beaut! And then as I opened my mouth to head him off, he came down to earth with, Very quietly, usually dark blues and browns. What jewelry did she wear? I've never seen her wear any. Any scars or moles? The horrified look on his white face urged me on to give him a full shot, or warts, or deformities that you know. He was speechless, but he managed to shake his head. Have you a photograph of her? Yes, I'll show you. He bounded to his feet, wound his way through the room's excessive furnishings, and out through a curtained doorway. Immediately he was back with a large photograph in a carved ivory frame. It was one of those artistic photographs, a thing of shadows and hazy outlines, not much good for identification purposes. She was beautiful, right enough, but that meant nothing. That's the purpose of an artistic photograph. This the only one you have? Yes. I'll have to borrow it, but I'll get it back to you as soon as I have my copies made. No, no, he protested against having his lady love's face given to a lot of gumshoes. That would be terrible. I finally got it, but it cost me more words than I like to waste on an incidental. I want to borrow a couple of her letters or something in her writing, too, I said. For what? To have photostatic copies made. Handwriting specimens come in handy. Give you something to go over hotel registers with. Then, even if going under fictitious names, people now and then write notes and make memorandums. We had another battle, out of which I came with three envelopes and two meaningless sheets of paper, all bearing the girl's angular writing. She have much money? I asked, when the disputed photograph and handwriting specimens were safely tucked away in my pocket. I don't know. It's not the sort of thing that one would pry into. She wasn't poor, that is, she didn't have to practice any petty economies, but I have the faintest idea as to the amount of her income or its source. She had an account at the Golden Gate Trust Company, but naturally I don't know anything about its size. Many friends here? That's another thing I don't know. I think she knew a few people here, but I don't know who they were. You see, when we were together we never talked about anything but ourselves. You know what I mean? There was nothing we were interested in but each other. We were simply... Can't you even make a guess at where she came from or who she was? No, those things don't matter to me. She was Jeanie Delano, and that was enough for me. Did you and she ever have any financial interests in common? I mean, was there ever any transaction in money or other valuables in which both of you were interested? What I meant, of course, was... Had she got into him for a loan, or had she sold him something, or got money out of him in any other way? He jumped to his feet, and his face went fog gray. Then he sat down again, slumped down, and blushed scarlet. Pardon me, he said thickly. You don't know her, and of course you must look at the thing from all angles. No, there was nothing like that. I'm afraid you're going to waste time if you're going to work on the theory that she was an adventuress. There was nothing like that. She was a girl with something terrible hanging over her, something that called her to Baltimore suddenly, something that has taken her away from me. Money? What could money have to do with it? I love her. 3. R. F. Axford received me in an office-like room in his Russian Hill residence. A big blond man, whose forty-eight or nine years had not blurred the outlines of an athlete's body. A big, full-blooded man with the manner of one whose self-confidence is complete and not altogether unjustified. "'What's I Burke been up to now?' he asked amusedly when I told him who I was. His voice was a pleasant, vibrant bass. I didn't give him all the details. He was engaged to marry a genie Delano, who went east about three weeks ago, and then suddenly disappeared. He knows very little about her, thinks something has happened to her, and wants her found. Again? His shrewd blue eyes twinkled. And to a genie this time. 
She's the fifth within a year, to my knowledge, and no doubt I missed one or two who were current while I was in Hawaii. But where do I come in? I asked him for a responsible endorsement. I think he's all right, but he isn't, in the strictest sense, a responsible person. He referred me to you. You're right about us not being, in the strictest sense, a responsible person. The big man screwed up his eyes and mouth and thought for a moment. Then, do you think that something has really happened to the girl? Or is Burke imagining things? I don't know. I thought it was a dream at first, but in a couple of her letters there are hints that something was wrong. You might go ahead and find her, then, Axford said. I don't suppose any harm will come from letting him have his genie back. It will at least give him something to think about for a while. I have your word for it, then, Mr. Axford, that there will be no scandal or anything of the sort connected with the affair? Assuredly. Burke is all right, you know. It's simply that he is spoiled. He has been in rather delicate health all his life, and then he has an income that suffices to keep him modestly, with a little over to bring out books of verse and buy doodahs for his rooms. He takes himself a little too solemnly. It's too much the poet. But he's sound at bottom. I'll go ahead with it, then, I said, getting up. By the way, the girl has an account at the Golden Gate Trust Company, and I'd like to find out as much about it as possible, especially where her money came from. Clement, the cashier, is a model of caution when it comes to giving out information about depositors. If you could put in a word for me, it would make my way smoother. Be glad to. He wrote a couple of lines across the back of a card and gave it to me, and promising to call on him if I needed further assistance, I left. 4. I telephoned Pangburn that his brother-in-law had given the job his approval. I sent a wire to the agency's Baltimore branch, giving what information I had. Then I went up to Ashbury Avenue to the apartment house in which the girl had lived. The manager, an immense Mrs. Clute in rustling black, knew little, if any more, about the girl than Pangburn. The girl had lived there for two and a half months. She had occasional callers, but Pangburn was the only one that the manager could describe to me. The girl had given up the apartment on the third of the month, saying that she had been called east, and she had asked the manager to hold her mail until she sent her new address. Ten days later, Mrs. Clute had received a card from the girl, instructing her to forward her mail to 215 North Stricker Street, Baltimore, Maryland. There had been no mail to forward. The single thing of importance that I learned at the apartment house was that the girl's two trunks had been taken away by a green transfer truck. Green was the color used by one of the city's largest transfer companies. I went then to the office of this transfer company and found a friendly clerk on duty. A detective, if he is wise, takes pains to make and keep as many friends as possible among transfer company, express company, and railroad employees. I left the office with a memorandum of the transfer company's check numbers and the ferry baggage room to which the two trunks had been taken. At the ferry building, with this information, it didn't take me many minutes to learn that the trunks had been checked to Baltimore. I sent another wire to the Baltimore branch, giving the railroad check numbers. Sunday was well into night by this time, so I knocked off and went home. 5. Half an hour before the Golden Gate Trust Company opened for business the next morning, I was inside, talking to Clement, the cashier. All the traditional caution and conservatism of bankers rolled together wouldn't be one, two, three to the amount usually displayed by this plump, white-haired old man. But one look at Axford's card with Please give the bearer all possible assistance, inked across the back of it, made Clement even eager to help me. You have or have had an account here in the name of Jeanie Delano, I said. I'd like to know as much as possible about it, to whom she draws checks and to what amounts, but especially all you can tell me about where her money came from. He stabbed one of the pearl buttons on his desk with a pink finger, and a lad with polished yellow hair oozed silently into the room. The cashier scribbled with a pencil on a piece of paper and gave it to the noiseless youth, who disappeared. Presently he was back, 
laying a handful of papers on the cashier's desk. Clement looked through the papers and then up at me. Miss Delano was introduced here by Mr. Burke Pangburn on the 6th of last month and opened an account with $850 in cash. She made the following deposits after that, $400 on the 10th, $250 on the 21st, $300 on the 26th, $200 on the 30th, and $20,000 on the 2nd of this month. All of these deposits, except the last, were made with cash. The last one was a check, which I have here. He handed it to me, a Golden Gate Trust Company check. Pay to the order of Jeannie Delano, $20,000. Signed, Burke Pangburn. It was dated the second of the month. Burke Pangburn? I exclaimed a little stupidly. Was it usual for him to draw checks to that amount? I think not, but we shall see. He stabbed the pearl button again, ran his pencil across another slip of paper, and the youth with the polished yellow hair made a noiseless entrance, exit, entrance, and exit. The cashier looked through the fresh batch of papers that had been brought to him. On the first of the month, Mr. Pangburn deposited $20,000, a check against Mr. Axford's account here. Now how about Miss Delano's withdrawals, I asked. He picked up the papers that had to do with her account again. Her statement and canceled checks for last month haven't been delivered to her yet. Everything is here. A check for $85 to the order of H.K. Clute on the 15th of last month, one to cash for $300 on the 20th, and another of the same kind for $100 on the 25th. Both of these checks were apparently cashed here by her. On the third of this month, she closed out her account with a check to her own order for $21,515. And that check was cashed here by her. I lighted a cigarette and let these figures drift around in my head. None of them, except those that were fixed to Pangburn's and Axford's signatures, seemed to be of any value to me. The Clute check, the only one the girl had drawn in anyone else's favor, had almost certainly been for rent. This is the way of it, I summed up aloud. On the first of the month, Pangburn deposited Axford's check for $20,000. The next day, he gave a check to that amount to Miss Delano, which she deposited. On the following day, she closed her account, taking between twenty-one and $22,000 in currency. Exactly, the cashier said. Six. Before going up to the Glinton apartments to find out why Pangburn hadn't come clean with me about the $20,000, I dropped in at the agency to see if any word had come from Baltimore. One of the clerks had just finished decoding a telegram. It read, Baggage arrived, Mount Royal Station on 8th. Taken away, same day. Unable to trace. 215 North Stricker Street, is Baltimore Orphan Asylum, girl not known there, continuing our efforts to find her. The old man came in from luncheon as I was leaving. I went back into his office with him for a couple of minutes. Did you see Pangburn? he asked. Yes, I'm working on his job now, but I think it's a bust. What is it? Pangburn is R. F. Axford's brother-in-law. He met a girl a couple of months ago and fell for her. She sizes up as a worker. He doesn't know anything about her. The first of the month he got $20,000 from his brother-in-law and passed it over to the girl. She blew, telling him that she had been called to Baltimore and giving him a phony address that turns out to be an orphan asylum. She sends her trunks to Baltimore and sent him some letters from there but a friend could have taken care of the baggage and could have remailed the letters for her. Of course, she would have needed a ticket to check the trunks on, but in a $20,000 game, that would be a small expense. Pangburn held out on me. He didn't tell me a word about the money. Ashamed of being easy pickings, I reckon. I'm going to the bat with him on it now. 
The old man smiled his mild smile that might mean anything, and I left. 7. Ten minutes of ringing Pangburn's bell brought no answer. The elevator boy told me he thought Pangburn hadn't been in all night. I put a note in his box and went down to the railroad company's offices, where I arranged to be notified if an unused Baltimore-San Francisco ticket was turned in for redemption. That done, I went up to the Chronicle office and searched the files for weather conditions during the past month, making a memorandum of four days upon which it had rained steadily day and night. I carried my memorandum to the offices of the three largest taxicab companies. This was a trick that had worked well for me before. The girl's apartment was some distance from the streetcar line, and I was counting upon her having gone out or having had a caller on one of those rainy dates. In either case, it was very likely that she or her caller had left in a taxi in preference to walking through the rain to the car line. The taxicab company's daily records would show any calls from her address and the fare's destinations. The ideal trick, of course, would have been to have had the records searched for the full extent of the girl's occupancy of the apartment, but no taxicab company would stand for having that amount of work thrust upon them unless it was a matter of life and death. It was difficult enough for me to persuade them to turn clerks loose on the four days I had selected. I called up Pangburn again after I left the last taxicab office, but he was not at home. I called up Axford's residence, thinking that the poet might have spent the night there, but was told that he had not. Late that afternoon I got my copies of the girl's photograph and handwriting, and put one of each in the mail for Baltimore. Then I went around to the three taxicab companies' offices and got my reports. Two of them had nothing for me. The third's records showed two calls from the girl's apartment. On one rainy afternoon, a taxi had been called, and one passenger had been taken to the Glenton Apartments. The passenger, obviously, was either the girl or Pangburn. At half-past twelve one night, another call had come in, and this passenger had been taken to the Marquis Hotel. The driver who had answered this second call remembered it indistinctly when I questioned him, but he thought that his fare had been a man. I let the matter rest there for the time. The Marquis isn't a large hotel, as San Francisco hotels go, but it is too large to make canvassing its guest for the one I wanted practicable. I spent the evening trying to reach Pangburn with no success. At eleven o'clock I called up Axford and asked him if he had any idea where I might find his brother-in-law. "'I haven't seen him for several days,' the millionaire said. "'He was supposed to come for dinner last night, but didn't. My wife tried to reach him by phone a couple of times today, but couldn't.'" 8. The next morning I called Pangburn's apartment before I got out of bed. Got no answer. Then I telephoned Axford and made an appointment for ten o'clock at his office. "'I don't know what he's up to now,' Axford said good-naturedly when I told him that Pangbert had apparently been away from his apartment since Sunday. "'And I suppose there's small chance of guessing. Our Burke is nothing if not erratic. How are you progressing with your search for the damsel in distress?' "'Far enough to convince me she isn't in a whole lot of distress. She got twenty thousand dollars from your brother-in-law the day before she vanished.' Twenty thousand dollars from Burke? Oh, she must be a wonderful girl. But wherever did he get that much money? From you. Axford's muscular body straightened in his chair. From me? Yes. Your check. He did not. There was nothing argumentative in his voice. It simply stated a fact. You didn't give him a check for twenty thousand dollars on the first of the month? No. Then, I suggested, perhaps we'd better take a run over to the Golden Gate Trust Company. Ten minutes later, we were in Clement's office. I'd like to see my canceled checks, Axford told the cashier. The youth with the polished yellow hair brought them in presently, a thick wad of them, and Axford ran rapidly through them until he found the one he wanted. He studied that one for a long while, and when he looked up at me, he shook his head slowly, but with finality. I've never seen it before. Clement mopped his head with a white handkerchief and tried to pretend that he wasn't burning up with curiosity 
and fears that his bank had been gypped. The millionaire turned the check over and looked at the endorsement. Deposited by Burke, he said in the voice of one who talks while he thinks of something entirely different. On the first. Could we talk to the teller who took in the $20,000 check that Miss Delano deposited? I asked Clement. He pressed one of his desk's pearl buttons with a fumbling pink finger, and in a minute or two a little sallow man with a hairless head came in. Do you remember taking a check for 20000 from Miss Jeanie Delano a few weeks ago? I asked him. Yes, sir, yes, sir, perfectly. Just what do you remember about it? Well, sir, Miss Delano came to my window with Mr. Burke Pangburn. It was his check. I thought it was a large check for him to be drawing, but the bookkeeper said he had enough money in his account to cover it. They stood there, Miss Delano and Mr. Pangburn, talking and laughing while I entered the deposit in her book, and then they left. And that was all. This check, Axford said slowly after the teller had gone back to his cage, is a forgery. But I shall make it good, of course. That ends the matter, Mr. Clement, and there must be no more to do about it. Certainly, Mr. Axford, certainly. Clement was all enormously relieved smiles and head-noddings with this $20,000 load lifted from his bank's shoulders. Axford and I left the bank then and got into his coupe, in which we had come from his office. But he did not immediately start the engine. He sat for a while, staring at the traffic of Montgomery Street with unseeing eyes. "'I want you to find Burke,' he said presently, and there was no emotion of any sort in his bass voice. I want you to find him without risking the least whisper of scandal. If my wife knew of all this, she mustn't know. She thinks her brother is a choice morsel. I want you to find him for me. The girl doesn't matter any more, but I suppose that where you find one, you'll find the other. I'm not interested in the money, and I don't want you to make any special attempt to recover that. It could hardly be done, I'm afraid, without publicity. I want you to find Burke before he does something else. If you want to avoid the wrong kind of publicity, I said, your best bet is to spread the right kind first. Let's advertise him as missing. Fill the papers up with his pictures and so forth. That'll play him up strong. He's your brother-in-law, and he's a poet. We can say that he's been ill. You told me that he had been in delicate health all his life, and that we fear he has dropped dead somewhere or is suffering under some mental derangement. There will be no necessity of mentioning the girl or the money, and our explanation may keep people, especially your wife, from guessing the truth when the fact he is missing leaks out. It's bound to leak out somehow. He didn't like my idea at first, but I finally won him over. We went up to Pangburn's apartment then, easily securing admittance on Axford's explanation that we had an engagement with him and would wait there for him. I went through the rooms inch by inch, prying into each hole and hollow and crack, reading everything that was written anywhere, even down to his manuscripts, and I found nothing that threw any light on his disappearance. I helped myself to his photographs, pocketing five of the dozen or more that were there, Axford did not think that any of the poet's bags or trunks were missing from the pack room. I did not find his Golden Gate Trust Company deposit book. I spent the rest of the day loading the newspapers up with what we wished them to have, and they gave my ex-client one grand spread, first-page stuff with photographs and all possible trimmings. Anyone in San Francisco who didn't know that Burke Pangburn, brother-in-law of R. F. Axford, an author of Sand Patches and Other Verse, was missing, either couldn't read or wouldn't. 9. The advertising brought results. By the following morning, reports were rolling in from all directions with dozens of people who had seen the missing poet in dozens of places. A few of these reports looked promising, or at least possible, but the majority were ridiculous on their faces. I came back to the agency from running out one that had until run out looked good to find a note on my desk asking me to call up Axford. Can you come down to my office now? He asked when I got him on the wire. 
There was a lad of twenty-one or two with Axford when I was ushered into his office, a narrow-chested, dandified lad of the sporting clerk type. "'This is Mr. Fall, one of my employees,' Axford told me. "'He says he saw Burke Sunday night.' "'Where?' I asked Fall. "'Going into a roadhouse near Half Moon Bay.' "'Sure it was him?' "'Absolutely. I've seen him come in here to Mr. Axford's office to know him. It was him all right.' "'How'd you come to see him?' "'I was coming in from further down the shore with some friends, and we stopped at the roadhouse to get something to eat.' As we were leaving, a car drove up, and Mr. Pangburn and a girl or woman, I didn't notice her particularly, got out and went inside. I didn't think anything of it until I saw in the paper last night that he hadn't been seen since Sunday. So then I thought to myself that— What roadhouse was this? I cut in, not being interested in his mental processes. The White Shack. About what time? Somewhere between 11.30 and midnight, I guess. He see you? No, I was already in our car when he drove up. I don't think he'd know me anyway. What did the woman look like? I don't know. I didn't see her face, and I can't remember how she was dressed or even if she was short or tall. That was all Fall could tell me. We shooed him out of the office, and I used Axford's telephone to call up Wap Healy's dive in North Beach and leave word that when Porky Grout came in, he was to call up Jack. That was a standing arrangement by which I got word to Porky whenever I wanted to see him without giving anybody a chance to tumble to the connection between us. "'Know the White Shack?' I asked Axford when I was through phoning. "'I know where it is, but I don't know anything about it.' "'Well, it's a tough hole, run by Tin Star Joplin, an ex-yeg who invested his winnings in the place when Prohibition made the roadhouse game good. He makes more money now than he ever heard in his piking safe-ripping days. Retailing liquor is a sideline with him. His real profit comes from acting as a relay station for the booze that comes through Half Moon Bay for points beyond, and the dope is that half the booze put ashore by the Pacific Rum Fleet is put ashore in Half Moon Bay. The White Shack is a tough hole and it's no place for your brother-in-law to be hanging around. I can't go down there myself without stirring things up. Joplin and I are old friends. But I've got a man I can put in there for a few nights. Pangburn may be a regular visitor, or he may even be staying there. He wouldn't be the first one Joplin had ever let hide out there. I'll put this man of mine in the place for a week, anyway, and see what he can find. It's all in your hands. "'Axford said. "'Find Burke without scandal. "'That's all I ask.' Ten. "'From Axford's office I went straight to my rooms, "'left the outer door unlocked, "'and sat down to wait for Porky Grout. "'I had waited an hour and a half "'when he pushed the door open and came in. "'Lo, how's tricks?' "'He swaggered to a chair, leaned back in it, "'put his feet on the table, "'and reached for a pack of cigarettes that lay there. That was Porky Grout, a pasty-faced man in his thirties, neither large nor small, always dressed flashily, even if sometimes dirtily, and trying to hide an enormous cowardice beyond a swaggering carriage, a blustering habit of speech, and an exaggerated pretense of self-assurance. But I had known him for three years, so now I crossed the room and pushed his feet roughly off the table, almost sending him over backward. "'What's the idea?' he came to his feet, crouching and snarling. "'Where do you get that stuff? Do you want to smack in a—' I took a step toward him. He sprang away across the room. "'Ah, oh, I didn't mean nothing. I was only kidding.' "'Shut up and sit down,' I advised him. I had known this porky grout for three years, and had been using him for nearly that long, and I didn't know a single thing that could be said in his favor. He was a coward, he was a liar, he was a thief and a hophead— he was a traitor to his kind, and if not watched, to his employers. A nice bird to deal with. But detecting is a hard business, and you use whatever tools come to hand. This porky was an effective tool if handled right, which meant keeping your hand on his throat all the time and checking up every piece of information he brought in. His cowardice was, for my purpose, his greatest asset. It was notorious throughout the criminal coast. And though nobody, crook or not, could possibly think him a man to be trusted, nevertheless he was not actually distrusted. 
Many of his fellows thought him too much the coward to be dangerous. They thought he would be afraid to betray them, afraid of the summary vengeance that crooked him visits upon the squealer. But they didn't take into account Porky's gift for convincing himself that he was a lion-hearted fellow when no danger was near. So he went freely where he desired and where I sent him, and brought me otherwise unobtainable bits of information upon matters in which I was interested. For nearly three years I had used him with considerable success, paying him well, and keeping him under my heel. Informant was the polite word that designated him in my reports. The underworld has even less lovely names than the common stool pigeon to denote his kind. I have a job for you, I told him, now that he was seated again with his feet on the floor. His loose mouth twitched up at the left corner, pushing that eye into a knowing squint. I thought so. He always says something like that. I want you to go down to Half Moon Bay and stick around Tin Star Joplin's joint for a few nights. Here are two photos, sliding one of Pangburn and one of the girl across the table. Their names and descriptions are written on the backs. I want to know if either of them shows up down there, what they're doing, and where they're hanging out. It may be that Tin Star is covering them up. Porky was looking knowingly from one picture to the other. I think I know this guy, he said out of the corner of his mouth that twitches. That's another thing about Porky. You can't mention a name or give a description that won't bring that same remark, even though you make them up. Here's some money. I slid some bills across the table. If you're down there more than a couple of nights, I'll get some more to you. Keep in touch with me, either over this phone or the undercover one at the office. And remember this, lay off the stuff. If I come down there and find you all snowed up, I promise that I'll tip Joplin off to you. He had finished counting the money by now. There wasn't a whole lot to count, and he threw it contemptuously back on the table. Save that for newspapers, he sneered. How am I going to get anywhere if I can't spend no money in the joint? That's plenty for a couple of days' expenses. You'll probably knock back half of it. If you stay longer than a couple of days, I'll get more to you. And you get your pay when the job is done, and not before. He shook his head and got up. I'm tired of piking along with you. You can turn your own jobs. I'm through. If you don't get down to Half Moon Bay tonight, you are through, I assured him, letting him get out of the threat whatever he liked. After a little while, of course, he took the money and left. The dispute over expense money was simply a preliminary that went with every job I sent about on. End of The Girl with the Silver Eyes, Part 1 The Girl with the Silver Eyes, Part 2 11 After Porky had cleared out, I leaned back in my chair and burned half a dozen Fatimas over the job. The girl had gone first with the $20,000, and then the poet had gone and both had gone, whether permanently or not, to the white shack. On its face, the job was an obvious affair. The girl had given Pangburn the work, to the extent of having him forge a check against his brother-in-law's account, and then, after various moves whose value I couldn't determine at the time, they had gone into hiding together. There were two loose ends to be taken care of. One of them, the finding of the confederate who had mailed the letters to Pangburn and who had taken care of the girl's baggage was in the Baltimore branch's hands. The other was who had ridden in the taxicab that I had traced from the girl's apartment to the Marquis Hotel. That might not have any bearing upon the job, or it might. Suppose I could find a connection between the Marquis Hotel and the White Shack. That would make a completed chain of some sort. I searched the back of the telephone directory and found the roadhouse number. Then I went up to the Marquis Hotel. The girl on duty at the hotel switchboard when I got there was one with whom I had done business before. "'Who's been calling Half Moon Bay numbers?' I asked her. "'My God!' She leaned back in her chair and ran a pink hand gently over the front of her rigidly waved red hair. I got enough to do without remembering every call it goes through. This ain't a boarding house. We have more than one call a week. 
You don't have many Half Moon Bay calls, I insisted, leaning an elbow on the counter, letting a folded five-spot peep out between the fingers of one hand. You ought to remember any you've had lately. I'll see, she sighed, as if willing to do her best on a hopeless task. She ran through her tickets. Here's one. From room 522, a couple of weeks ago. What number was called? Half Moon Bay, 51. That was the roadhouse number. I passed over the five spot. Is 522 a permanent guest? Yes, Mr. Kilcourse. He's been here three or four months. What is he? I don't know. A perfect gentleman, if you ask me. That's nice. What does he look like? Tall and elegant. Be yourself, I pleaded. What does he look like? He's a young man, but his hair is turning gray. He's dark and handsome. Looks like a movie actor. Bull Montana? I asked as I moved off toward the desk. The key to 522 was in its place in the rack. I sat down where I could keep an eye on it. Perhaps an hour later, a clerk took it out and gave it to a man who did look something like an actor. He was a man of thirty or so, with dark skin and dark hair that showed gray around the ears. He stood a good six feet of fashionably dressed slenderness. Carrying the key, he disappeared into an elevator. I called up the agency then and asked the old man to send Dick Foley over. Ten minutes later, Dick arrived. He's a little shrimp of a Canadian, there isn't a hundred and ten pounds of him, who's the smoothest shadow I've ever seen, and I've seen most of them. I have a bird here I want tailed, I told Dick. His name is Kilcourse, and he's in room 522. Stick around outside, and I'll give you the spot on him. I went back to the lobby and waited some more. At eight o'clock, Kilcourse came down and left the hotel. I went after him for half a block, far enough to turn him over to Dick, and then went home, so that I would be within reach of a telephone if Porky Grout tried to get in touch with me. No call came from him that night. 12. When I arrived at the agency the next morning, Dick was waiting for me. What luck? I asked. Damnedest. The little Canadian talks like a telegram when his peace of mind is disturbed, and just now he was decidedly peevish. Took me two blocks. Shook me. Only taxi in sight. Think he made you? No. Wise head. Playing safe. Try him again, then. Better have a car handy in case he tries the same trick again. My telephone jingled as Dick was going out. It was Porky Grout talking over the agency's unlisted line. Turn up anything? I asked. Plenty, he bragged. Good. Are you in town? Yes. I'll meet you in my rooms in twenty minutes, I said. The pasty-faced informant was fairly bloated with pride in himself when he came through the door I had left unlocked for him. His swagger was almost a cakewalk, and the side of his mouth that twitches was twisted into a knowing leer that would have fit a Solomon. I knocked it over for you, kid, he boasted. Nothing to it for me. I went down there and talked to everybody that knowed anything, seen everything there was to see, and put the x-ray on the whole dump. I made a... Uh Uh-huh, I interrupted. Congratulations, and so forth. But just what did you turn up? Now, let me tell you. He raised a dirty hand in a traffic cop sort of gesture and blew a stream of cigarette smoke at the ceiling. Don't crowd me. I'll give you all the dope. Sure, I said. I know. You're great, and I'm lucky to have you knock off my jobs for me and all that. But is Pangburn down there? I'm getting around to that. I went down there and... Did you see Pangburn? As I was saying, I went down there and... Porky, I said, I don't give a damn what you did. Did you see Pangburn? Yes, I seen him. Fine. Now what did you see? He's camping down there with Tin Star. Him and the broad that you gave me a picture of are both there. She's been there a month. I didn't see her, but one of the waiters told me about her. 
I seen Pangburn myself. They don't show themselves much, stick back in Tin Star's part of the joint, where he lives, most of the time. Pangburn's been there since Sunday. I went down there and learn who the girl is or anything about what they're up to. No, I went down there and all right, went down there again tonight. Call me up as soon as you know positively Pangburn is there, that he hasn't gone out. Don't make any mistakes. I don't want to come down there and scare them up on a false alarm. Use the agency's undercover line and just tell whoever answers that you won't be in town until late. That'll mean that Pangburn is there, and it'll let you call up from Joplin's without giving the play away. I got to have more dough, he said as he got up. It cost. I'll file your application, I promised. Now beat it, and let me hear from you tonight the minute you're sure Pangburn is there. Then I went up to Axford's office. I think I have a line on him, I told the millionaire. I hope to have him where you can talk to him tonight. My man says he was there at the White Shack last night and is probably living there. If he's there tonight, I'll take you down if you want. Why can't we go down now? No, the place is too dead in the daytime for my man to hang around without making himself conspicuous. And I don't want to take any chances on either you or me showing ourselves there until we're sure we're coming face to face with Pangburn. What do you want me to do, then? Have a fast car ready tonight and be ready to start as soon as I get word to you. Right-o. I'll be at home after 5.30. Phone me as soon as you're ready to go, and I'll pick you up. 13. At 9.30 that evening, I was sitting beside Axford on the front seat of a powerfully engined foreign car, and we were roaring down a road that led to Half Moon Bay. Porky's telephone call had come. Neither of us talked much during that ride, and the imported monster under us made it a rather short ride. Axford sat comfortable and relaxed at the wheel, but I noticed for the first time that he had a rather heavy jaw. The White Shack is a large building, square-built, of imitation stone. It is set away back from the road and is approached by two curving driveways, which together make a semicircle whose diameter is the public road. The center of this semicircle is occupied by sheds under which Joplin's patrons stow their cars, and here and there about the sheds are flower beds and clumps of shrubbery. We were still going at a fair clip when we turned into one end of this semicircle driveway, and Axford slammed on his brakes, and the big machine threw us into the windshield as it jolted into an abrupt stop, barely in time to avoid smashing in to a cluster of people who had suddenly loomed up before us. In the glow from our headlights, faces stood sharply out, white, horrified faces, furtive faces, faces that were callously curious. Below the faces, white arms and shoulders showed, and bright gowns and jewelry, against the duller background of masculine clothing. This was the first impression I got, and then by the time I had removed my face from the windshield, I realized that this cluster of people had a core, a thing about which it centered. I stood up, trying to look over the crowd's heads, but I could see nothing. Jumping down to the driveway, I pushed through the crowd. Face down on the white gravel, a man sprawled, a thin man in dark clothes, and just above his collar, where the head and neck join, was a hole. I knelt to peer into his face. Then I pushed through the crowd again, back to where Axford was just getting out of the car, the engine of which was still running. Pangman is dead. Shot. 14. Methodically, Axford took off his gloves, folded them, and put them in a pocket. Then he nodded his understanding of what I had told him, and walked toward where the crowd stood around the dead poet. I looked after him until he had vanished in the throng. Then I went winding through the outskirts of the crowd, hunting for Porky Grout. I found him standing on the porch, leaning against a pillar. I passed where he could see me, and went on around to the side of the roadhouse that afforded most shadow. In the shadows, Porky joined me. The night wasn't cool, but his teeth were chattering. Who got him? I demanded. I don't know, he whined, and that was the first thing of which I had ever known him to confess complete ignorance. I was inside, keeping an eye on the others. What others? 
tin-star and some guy I'd never seen before in the broad. I didn't think the kid was going out. He didn't have no hat. What do you know about it? A little while after I phoned you, the girl and Pangburn came out from Joplin's part of the joint and sat down at a table around on the other side of the porch where it's fairly dark. They eat for a while, and then this other guy comes over and sits down with them. I don't know his name, but I think I have saw him around town. He's a tall guy, all rung up in fancy rags. That would be Kilcores. They talk for a while, and then Joplin joins them. They sit around the table laughing and talking for maybe a quarter of an hour. Then Pangburns gets up and goes indoors. I got a table that I can watch him from, and the place is crowded, and I'm afraid I'll lose my table if I leave it, so I don't follow the kid. He ain't got no hat, and I figure he ain't going nowhere. But he must have gone through the house and out front, because pretty soon there's a noise I thought was an auto backfire, and then the sound of a car getting away quick. And then some guy squawks that there's a dead man outside. Everybody runs out, and it's Pangburn. You dead sure that Joplin, Kilhorse, and the girl were all at the table when Pangburn was killed? Absolutely, Porky said. If this dark guy's name is Kilhorse. Where are they now? Back in Joplin's hangout. They went up there as soon as they seen Pangburn had been croaked. I had no illusions about Porky. I knew he was capable of selling me out and furnishing the poet's murderer with an alibi. But there was this about it. If Joplin, Kilcourse, or the girl had fixed him, and had fixed my informant, then it was hopeless for me to try and prove that they weren't on the rear porch when the shot was fired. Joplin had a crowd of hangers-on who would swear to anything he told them without batting an eye. There would be a dozen supposed witnesses to their presence on the rear porch. Thus the only thing for me to do was to take it for granted that Porky was coming clean with me. "'Have you seen Dick Foley?' I asked, since Dick had been shadowing Kilcourse. "'No. Hunt around and see if you can find him. Tell him I've gone up to talk to Joplin, and tell him to come on up. Then you can stick around where I can get hold of you if I want you.' I went in through a French window, crossed an empty dance floor, and went up the stairs that led to Tin Star Joplin's living quarters in the rear second story. I knew the way, having been up there before. Joplin and I were old friends. I was going up now to give him and his friends a shakedown on the off chance that some good might come of it, though I knew that I had nothing on any of them. I could have tied something on the girl, of course, but not without advertising the fact that the dead poet had forged his brother-in-law's signature to a check, and that was a no-go. "'Come in,' a heavy, familiar voice called when I rapped on Joplin's living room door. I pushed the door open in one end. Tin Star Joplin was standing in the middle of the floor, a big-bodied ex yeg with inordinately thick shoulders and an expressionless horse face. Beyond him, Kilcourse sat, dangling one leg from the corner of a table, alertness hiding behind an amused half-smile on his handsome, dark face. On the other side of a room, a girl whom I knew for Jeanie Delano sat on the arm of a big leather chair, and the poet hadn't exaggerated when he told me she was beautiful. "'You,' Joplin grunted disgustedly as soon as he recognized me. "'What the hell do you want?' "'What do you got?' My mind wasn't on this kind of repartee, however. I was studying the girl. There was something vaguely familiar about her, but I couldn't place her. Perhaps I hadn't seen her before. Perhaps much looking at the picture Pangburn had given me was responsible for my feeling of recognition. Pictures will do that. Meanwhile, Joplin had said, Time to waste is one thing I ain't got. And I had said, if you'd saved up all the time different judges have given you, you'd have plenty. I had seen the girl somewhere before. She was a slender girl, in a glistening blue gown that exhibited a generous spread of front, back, and arms that were worth showing. She had a mass of dark brown hair above an oval face of the color that pink ought to be. Her eyes were wide-set, and of a gray shade that wasn't altogether unlike the shadows on polished silver that the poet had compared them to. I studied the girl. 
and she looked back at me with level eyes, and still I couldn't place her. Kilcorse sat dangling a leg from the table corner. Joplin grew impatient. "'Will you stop gandering at the girl and tell me what you want of me?' he growled. The girl smiled then, a mocking smile that bared the edges of razor-sharp little animal teeth, and with the smile I knew her. Her hair and skin had fooled me. The last time I had seen her, the only time I had seen her before, her face had been marble white, and her hair had been short and the color of fire. She and an older woman and three men and I had played hide-and-seek one evening in a house in Turk Street over a matter of the murder of a bank messenger and the theft of a hundred thousand dollars' worth of liberty bonds. Through her intriguing, three of her accomplices had died that evening, and the fourth, the Chinese, had eventually gone to the gallows of Folsom Prison. Her name had been Elvira then, and since her escape from the house that night we had been fruitlessly hunting her from border to border and beyond. Recognition must have shown in my eyes, in spite of the effort I made to keep them blank, for swift as a snake she had left the arm of the chair and was coming forward, her eyes more steel than silver. I put my gun in sight. Joplin took a half-step toward me. "'What's the idea?' he barked. Kilcorse slid off the table, and one of his thick, dark hands hovered over his necktie. "'This is the idea,' I told him. "'I want the girl for a murder a couple of months back, and maybe, I'm not sure, for tonight's. Anyway, I'm—' The snapping of a light switch behind me, and the room went black. I moved, not caring where I went, so long as I got away from where I had been when the lights went out. My back touched a wall, and I stopped, crouching low. "'Quick, kid!' a hoarse whispered that came from where I thought the door should be. But both of the room's doors, I thought, were closed and could hardly be opened without showing gray rectangles. People moved in the blackness, but none got between me and the lighter square of windows. Something clicked softly in front of me. Too thin a click for the cocking of a gun, but it could have been the opening of a spring knife, and I remembered that Tin Star Joplin had a fondness for that weapon. "'Let's go, let's go!' A harsh whisper that cut through the dark like a blow. Sounds of motion, muffled, indistinguishable. One sound not far away. Abruptly, a strong hand clamped one of my shoulders. A hard-muscled body strained against me. I stabbed out with my gun and heard a grunt. The hand moved up my shoulder toward my throat. I snapped up a knee and heard another grunt. A burning point ran down my side. I stabbed again with my gun, pulled it back until the muzzle was clear of the soft obstacle that had stopped it, and squeezed the trigger. The crash of the shot. Joplin's voice in my ear, a curiously matter-of-fact voice. God damn, that got me. Fifteen. I spun away from him then, toward where I saw the dim yellow of an open door. I had heard no sounds of departure, I had been too busy but I knew that Joplin had tied into me while the others made their getaway. Nobody was in sight as I jumped, slid, tumbled down the steps any number at a time. A waiter got in my way as I plunged toward the dance floor. I don't know whether his interference was intentional or not. I didn't ask. I slammed the flat of my gun in his face and went on. Once I jumped a leg that came out to trip me, and at the outer door I had to smear another face. Then I was out in the semicircular driveway, from one end of which a red taillight was turning east into the country road. While I sprinted for Axford's car, I noticed that Pangburn's body had been removed. A few people still stood around the spot where he had lain, and they gaped at me now with open mouths. The car was as Axford had left it, with idling engine. I swung it through a flower bed and pointed it east on the public road. Five minutes later, I picked up the red point of a taillight again. The car under me had more power than I would ever need, more than I would have known how to handle. I don't know how fast the one ahead was going, but I closed in as if it had been standing still. A mile and a half, or perhaps two. Suddenly a man was in the road ahead, a little beyond the reach of my lights. The lights caught him, and I saw that it was Porky Grout. Porky Grout, standing, facing me in the middle of the road, the dull metal of an automatic in each hand. 
The guns in his hand seemed to glow dimly red and then go dark in the glare of my headlights, glow and then go dark like two bulbs in an automatic electric sign. The windshield fell apart around me. Porky Grout, the informant whose name was a synonym for cowardice, the full length of the Pacific coast, stood in the center of the road, shooting at a metal comet that rushed down upon him. I didn't see the end. I confess frankly that I shut my eyes when his set white face showed close over my radiator. The metal monster under me trembled, not very much, and the road ahead was empty, except for the fleeting red light. My windshield was gone. The wind tore at my uncovered hair and brought tears to my squinted-up eyes. Presently I found that I was talking to myself, saying, "'That was Porky! That was Porky!' It was an amazing fact. It was no surprise that he had double-crossed me. That was to be expected. And for to him have crept up the stairs behind me and turned off the lights wasn't astonishing. But for him to have stood straight up and died. An orange streak from the car ahead cut off my wonderment. The bullet didn't come near me. It isn't easy to shoot accurately from one moving car into another. But at the pace I was going, it wouldn't be long before I was close enough for good shooting. I turned on the searchlight above the dashboard. It didn't quite reach the car ahead, but it enabled me to see that the girl was driving, while Kilcor sat screwed around beside her, facing me. The car was a yellow roadster. I eased up a little. In a duel with Kilcor's here, I would have been at a disadvantage, since I would have had to drive as well as shoot. My best play seemed to be to hold my distance until we reached a town, as we inevitably must. It wasn't midnight yet, there would be people on the streets of any town, and policemen. Then I could close in with a better chance of coming off on top. A few miles of this, and my prey tumbled to my plan. The yellow roadster slowed down, wavered, and came to rest with its length across the road. Kilcourse and the girl were out immediately and crouching in the road on the far side of their barricade. I was tempted to drive pell-mell into them, but it was a weak temptation, and when its short life had passed, I put on the brakes and stopped. Then I fiddled with my searchlight until it bore full upon the roadster. A flash came from somewhere near the roadster's wheels, and the searchlight shook violently, but the glass wasn't touched. It would be their first target, of course, and, crouching in my car waiting for the bullet that would smash the lens, I took off my shoes and overcoat. The third bullet ruined the light. I switched off the other lights, jumped to the road, and when I stopped running I was squatting down against the near side of the yellow roadster as easy and safe a trick as can be imagined. The girl and Kilcourse had been looking into the glare of a powerful light. When that light suddenly died, and the weaker ones around it went too, they were left in pitch, unseeing blackness, which must last for the minute or longer that their eyes would need to readjust themselves to the gray-black of the night. My stockinged feet had made no sound on the macadam road, and now there was only a roadster between us, and I knew it, and they didn't. From near the radiator, Kilcor spoke softly. "'I'm going to try to knock him off from the ditch. Take a shot at him now and then to keep him busy.' "'I can't see him,' the girl protested. "'Your eyes will be all right in a second. Take a shot at the car anyway.' I moved toward the radiator as the girl's pistol barked at the empty touring car. Kilcor, on hands and knees, was working his way toward the ditch that ran along the south side of the road. I gathered my legs under me, intent upon a spring and a blow with my gun upon the back of his head. I didn't want to kill him, but I wanted to put him out of the way, quick. I'd have the girl to take care of, and she was at least as dangerous as he. As I tensed for the spring, Kilcourse, guided perhaps by some instinct of the hunted, turned his head and saw me, saw a threatening shadow. Instead of jumping, I fired. I didn't look to see whether I'd hit him or not. At that range, there was little likelihood of missing. I bent double and slipped back to the rear of the roadster, keeping on my side of it. Then I waited. The girl did what I would perhaps have done in her place. She didn't shoot or move toward the place the shot had come from. She thought I had forestalled kill course in using the ditch and that my next play would be to circle around behind her. To offset this, she moved around the rear of the roadster so that she could ambush me from the side nearest Axford's car. Thus it was that she came creeping around the corner and poked her delicately chiseled nose plunk into the muzzle of the gun that I held ready for her. She gave a little scream. Women aren't always reasonable. They are prone to disregard trifles like guns held upon them. So I grabbed her gun hand, which was fortunate for me. As my hand closed around the weapon, she pulled the trigger. 
catching a chunk of my forefinger between hammer and frame. I twisted the gun out of her hand, released my finger. But she wasn't done yet. With me standing there holding a gun not four inches from her body, she turned and bolted off toward where a clump of trees made a jet-black blot to the north. When I recovered from my surprise at this amateurish procedure, I stuck both her gun and mine in my pockets and set out after her, tearing the soles of my feet at every step. She was trying to get over a wire fence when I caught her. 16. Stop playing, will you? I said crossly, as I set the fingers of my left hand around her wrist, started to lead her back to the roadster. This is a serious business. Don't be so childish. You are hurting my arm. I knew I wasn't hurting her arm, and I knew this girl for the direct cause of four or perhaps five deaths. Yet I loosened my grip on her wrist until it wasn't much more than a friendly clasp. She went back willingly enough to the roadster, where, still holding her wrist, I switched on the lights. Kilcourse lay just beneath the headlight's glare, huddled on his face with one knee drawn up under him. I put the girl squarely in the line of light. "'Now stand there,' I said, "'and behave. The first break you make, I'm going to shoot a leg out from under you.' And I meant it. I found Kilcourse's gun, pocketed it, and knelt beside him. He was dead with a bullet hole above his collarbone. Is he... Her mouth trembled. Yes. She looked down at him and shivered a little. Poor fag, she whispered. I've gone on record as saying that this girl was beautiful. And standing there in the dazzling white of the headlights, she was more than that. She was a thing to start crazy thoughts. Even in the head of an unimaginative middle-aged thief-catcher, she was... Anyway, I suppose that's why I scowled at her and said, Yes, poor fag, and poor hook, and poor tie, and poor kind of a Los Angeles bank messenger, and poor Burke, calling the roll, so far as I knew it, of men who had died loving her. She didn't flare up. Her big gray eyes lifted, and she looked at me with a gaze that I couldn't fathom and her lovely oval face under the mass of brown hair, which I knew was phony, was sad. "'I suppose you do think,' she began. But I had had enough of this. I was uncomfortable along the spine. "'Come on,' I said. "'We'll leave Kilcourse and the roadster here for the present.' She said nothing, but went with me to Axford's big machine, and sat in silence while I laced my shoes. I found a robe on the back seat and gave it to her. Better wrap this around your shoulders. The windshield is gone. It'll be cool. She followed my suggestion without a word. But when I had edged our vehicle around the rear of the roadster and it straightened out in the road again, going east, she laid a hand on my arm. Aren't we going back to the white shack? No. Redwood City. The county jail. A mile, perhaps, during which without looking at her I knew she was studying my rather lumpy profile. Then her hand was on my forearm again, and she was leaning toward me so that her breath was warm against my cheek. Will you stop for a minute? There's something, some things I want to tell you. I brought the car to a halt in a cleared space of hard soil off to one side of the road, and screwed myself a little around in the seat to face her more directly. Before you start, I told her, I want you to understand that we stay here for just so long as you talk about the Pangburn affair. When you get off on any other line, then we finish our trip to Redwood City. Aren't you even interested in the Los Angeles affair? No, it's closed. You and Hook Rorden and Tai Chun Tao and the Quarries were equally responsible for the messenger's death, even if Hook did the actual killing. Hook and the Quarries passed out the night we had our party at Turk Street. Tai was hanged last month. Now I've got you. We had enough evidence to swing the Chinese, and we've got even more against you. That is done, finished, completed. If you want to tell me anything about Pangburn's death, I'll listen. Otherwise, I reached for the self-starter. A pressure of her fingers on my arm stopped me. I do want to tell you about it, she said earnestly. I want you to know the truth about it. You'll take me to Redwood City, I know. Don't think that I expect that I have any foolish hopes. 
but I'd like you to know the truth about this thing. I don't know why I should care, especially what you think, but... Her voice dwindled off to nothing. Seventeen. Then she began to talk very rapidly, as people talk when they fear interruptions before their stories are told. And she sat, leaning slightly forward, so that her beautiful oval face was very close to mine. After I ran out of the Turk Street house that night, while you were struggling with Ty, my intention was to get away from San Francisco. I had a couple of thousand dollars, enough to carry me any place. Then I thought that going away would be what you people would expect me to do, and that the safest thing for me to do would be to stay right here. It isn't hard for a woman to change her appearance. I had bobbed red hair, white skin, and wore gay clothes. I simply dyed my hair, bought these transformations to make it look long, put color on my face, and bought some dark clothes. Then I took an apartment on Ashbury Avenue under the name of Jeanie Delano, and I was an altogether different person. But while I knew I was perfectly safe from recognition anywhere, I felt more comfortable staying indoors for a while, and to pass the time, I read a good deal. That's how I happened to run across Burke's book. Do you read poetry? I shook my head. An automobile going down toward Half Moon Bay came into sight just then, the first one we'd seen since we left the white shack. She waited until it had passed before she went on, still talking rapidly. Burke wasn't a genius, of course, but there was something about some of his things that, something that got inside me. I wrote him a little note, telling him how much I had enjoyed those things, and sent it to his publishers. A few days later, I had a note from Burke, and I learned that he lived in San Francisco. I hadn't known that. We exchanged several notes, and then he asked if he could call, and we met. I don't know whether I was in love with him or not. Even at first, I did like him, and between the ardor of his love for me and the flattery of having a fairly well-known poet for a suitor, I really thought that I loved him. I promised to marry him. I hadn't told him anything about myself, though now I know that it wouldn't have made any difference to him. But I was afraid to tell him the truth, and I wouldn't lie to him, so I told him nothing. Then Thag Kilcourse saw me one day in the street and knew me in spite of my new hair, complexion, and clothes, Fag hadn't much brains, but he had eyes that could see through anything. I don't blame Fag. He acted according to his code. He came up to my apartment, having followed me home, and I told him that I was going to marry Burke and be a respectable housewife. That was dumb of me. Fag was square. If I had told him that I was ribbing Burke up for a trimming, Fag would have let me alone, would have kept his hands off. But when I told him that I was through with the graft, had gone queer, that made me his meat. You know how crooks are. Everyone in the world is either a fellow crook or a prospective victim. So if I was no longer a crook, then Fag considered me fair game. He learned about Burke's family connections, and then he put it up to me. Twenty thousand dollars, or he'd turn me up. He knew about the Los Angeles job, and he knew how badly I was wanted. I was up against it then. I knew I couldn't hide from Fag or run away from him. I told Burke that I had to have $20,000. I didn't think he had that much, but I thought he could get it. Three days later, he gave me a check for it. I didn't know at the time how he had raised it, but it wouldn't have mattered if I had known. I had to have it. But that night, he told me where he got the money. He had forged his brother-in-law's signature. He told me because, after thinking it over, he was afraid that when the forgery was discovered, I would be caught with him and considered equally guilty. I'm rotten in spots, but I wasn't rotten enough to let him put himself in the pen for me without knowing what it was all about. I told him the whole story. He didn't bat an eye. He insisted that the money be paid Kilcourse so that I would be safe and began to plan for my further safety. Burke was confident that his brother-in-law wouldn't send him over for forgery, but to be on the safe side, he insisted that I move and change my name again and lay low until we knew how Axford was going to take it. But that night, after he had gone, I made some plans of my own. I did like Burke. I liked him too much to let him be the goat without trying to save him, and I didn't have a great deal of faith in Axford's kindness. This was the second of the month. 
barring accidents, Axford wouldn't discover the forgery until he got his cancelled checks early the following month. That gave me practically a month to work in. The next day I drew all my money out of the bank and sent Burke a letter, saying that I had been called to Baltimore, and I laid a clear trail to Baltimore, with baggage and letters and all, which a pal there took care of for me. Then I went down to Joplin's and got him to put me up. I let Fag know I was there, and when he came down I told him I expected to have the money for him in a day or two. He came down nearly every day after that, and I installed him from day to day, and each time it got easier. But my time was getting short. Pretty soon Burke's letters would be coming back from the phony address I had given him, and I wanted to be on hand to keep him from doing anything foolish. And I didn't want to get in touch with him until I could give him the 20000 so he could square the forgery before Axford learned of it from his castle checks. Fag was getting easier and easier to handle, but I still didn't have him where I wanted him. He wasn't willing to give up the $20,000, which I was, of course, holding all this time, until I promised to stick with him for good. And I still thought I was in love with Burke, and I didn't want to tie myself up with Fag, even for a little while. Then Burke saw me on the street one Sunday night. I was careless, and drove into the city in Joplin's Roadster, the one back there. And as luck would have it, Burke saw me. I told him the truth, the whole truth, and he told me that he had just hired a private detective to find me. He was like a child in some ways. It hadn't occurred to him that the sleuth would dig up anything about the money, but I knew the forged check would be found in a day or two at the most. I knew it. When I told Burke that, he went to pieces. All his faith in his brother-in-law's forgiveness went. I couldn't leave him the way he was. He'd have babbled the whole thing to the first person he met. So I brought him back to Joplin's with me. My idea was to hold him there for a few days until we could see how things were going. If nothing appeared in the papers about the check, then we could take it for granted that Axford had hushed the matter up and Burke could go home and try to square himself. On the other hand, if the papers got the whole story, then Burke would have to look for a permanent hiding place, and so would I. Tuesday evenings and Wednesday mornings papers were full of the news of his disappearance, but nothing was said about the check. That looked good, but we waited another day for good measure. Fag Kilcourse was in on the game by this time, of course, and I had to pass over the twenty thousand dollars, but I still had hopes of getting it, or most of it, back, so I continued to string him along. I had a hard time keeping him off Burke, though, because he had begun to think that he had some sort of right to me, and jealousy made him wicked. But I got Tinstar to throw a scare into him, and I thought Burke was safe. Tonight one of Tinstar's men came up and told us that a man named Porky Grout, who had been hanging around the place for a couple of nights, had made a couple of cracks that might mean he was interested in us. Grout was pointed out to me, and I took a chance on showing myself in the public part of the place and sat at a table close to his. He was plain rat, as I guess you know, and in less than five minutes I had him at my table, and half an hour later I knew that he had tipped you off that Burke and I were at the White Shack. He didn't tell me this all right out, but he told me more than enough for me to guess the rest. I went up and told the others. Fag was for killing both Grout and Burke right away, but I talked him out of it. That wouldn't help us any, and I had Grout where he would jump in the ocean for me. I thought I had Fag convinced, but we finally decided that Burke and I would take the roadster and leave, and that when you got here Porky Grout was to pretend he was hopped up and point out a man and a woman, any who happened to be handy, as the ones he had taken for us. I stopped to get a cloak and gloves, and Burke went on out to the car alone, and Fag shot him. I didn't know he was going to. I wouldn't have let him. Please believe that. I wasn't as much in love with Burke as I had thought, but please believe that after all he had done for me I wouldn't have let them hurt him. After that it was a case of stick with the others, whether I liked it or not and I stuck. We ribbed Grout to tell you that all three of us were on the back porch when Burke was killed, and we had any number of others primed with the same story. Then you came up and recognized me. Just my luck that it had to be you, the only detective in San Francisco who knew me. You know the rest, how Porky Grout came out behind you and turned off the lights, and Joplin held you while we ran for the car, and then... When you closed in on us, Grout offered to stand you off while we got clear, and now... 
eighteen. Her voice died, and she shivered a little. The robe I had given her had fallen away from her white shoulders. Whether or not it was because she was so close against my shoulder, I shivered too. And my fingers, fumbling into my pocket for a cigarette, brought it out, twisted and mashed. That's all there is to the part you promised to listen to, she said softly, her face turned half away. I wanted you to know. You're a hard man, but somehow I... I cleared my throat, and the hand that held the mangled cigarette was suddenly steady. Now don't be crude, sister, I said. Your work has been too smooth so far to be spoiled by rough stuff now. She laughed, a brief laugh that was bitter and reckless, just a little weary. And she thrust her face still closer to mine, and the gray eyes were soft and placid. Little fat detective whose name I don't know. Her voice had a tired huskiness in it, and a tired mockery. You think I am playing a part, don't you? You think I am playing for liberty. Perhaps I am. I certainly would take it if it were offered me. But men have thought me beautiful, and I have played with them. Women are like that. Men have loved me, and doing what I liked with them, I have found men contemptible. And then comes this little fat detective, whose name I don't know, and he acts as if I were a hag, an old squaw. Can I help then being piqued into some sort of feeling for him? Women are like that. Am I so homely that any man has a right to look at me without even interest? Am I ugly? I shook my head. You're quite pretty. I said, struggling to keep my voice as casual as the words. You beast, she spat, and then her smile grew gentle again. And yet, it is because of that attitude that I sit here and turn myself inside out for you. If you were to take me in your arms and hold me close to the chest that I am already leaning against, and if you were to tell me that there is no jail ahead for me just now, I would be glad, of course. But though for a while you might hold me, you would then be only one of the men with which I am familiar, men who love and are used and are succeeded by other men. But because you do none of these things, because you are a wooden block of a man, I find myself wanting you. Would I tell you this, little fat detective, if I were playing a game? I grunted noncommittally and forcibly restrained my tongue from running out to moisten my dry lips. I'm going to this jail tonight, if you were the same hard man who has goaded me into whining love into his uncaring ears. But before that, can I have one wholehearted assurance that you think me a little more than quite pretty? Or at least a hint that if I were not a prisoner, your pulse might beat a little faster when I touch you. I'm going to this jail for a long while, perhaps to the gallows. Can't I take my vanity there, not quite in tatters, to keep me company? Can't you do some slight thing to keep me from the afterthought of having bleated all this out to a man who is simply bored? Her lids had come down half over the silver-gray eyes. Her head had tilted back so far that a little pulse showed throbbing in her white throat. Her lips were motionless over slightly parted teeth as the last words had left them. My fingers went deep into the soft white flesh of her shoulders. Her head went further back, her eyes closed. One hand came to my shoulder. You're beautiful as all hell, I shouted crazily into her face and flung her against the door. It seemed an hour that I fumbled with starter and gears before I had the car back on the road and thundering toward the San Mateo County Jail. The girl had straightened herself up in the seat again, and sat huddled within the robe I had given her. I squinted straight ahead into the wind that tore at my face and hair. In the absence of the windshield took my thoughts back to Porky Grout. Porky Grout, whose yellowness was notorious from Seattle to San Diego, standing rigidly in the path of a charging metal monster with an inadequate pistol in each hand. She had done that to Porky Grout, this woman beside me. She had done that to Porky Grout, and he hadn't even been human, 
a slimy reptile whose highest thought had been a skinful of dope had gone grimly to death that she might get away. She, this woman whose shoulders I had gripped, whose mouth had been close under mine. I let the car out another notch, holding the road somehow. We went through a town, a scurrying of pedestrians for safety, surprised faces staring at us, street lights glistening on the moisture the wind had whipped from my eyes. I passed blindly by the road I wanted, circled back to it, and we were out in the country again. 19. At the foot of a long, shallow hill, I applied the brakes, and we snapped to motionlessness. I thrust my face close to the girls. Furthermore, you are a liar! I knew I was shouting foolishly, but I was powerless to lower my voice. Pangburn never put Axford's name on that check. He never knew anything about it. You got in with him because you knew his brother-in-law was a millionaire. You pumped him, finding out everything he knew about his brother-in-law's account at the Golden Gate Trust. You stole Pangburn's bank book. It wasn't in his room when I searched it, and deposited the forged Axford check to his credit, knowing that under those circumstances the check wouldn't be questioned. The next day you took Pangburn into the bank, saying you were going to make a deposit. You took him in because, with him standing beside you, the check to which his signature had been forged wouldn't be questioned. You knew that, being a gentleman, he'd take pains not to see what you were depositing. Then you framed the Baltimore trip. He told the truth to me, the truth so far as he knew it. Then you met him Sunday night, maybe accidentally, maybe not. Anyway, you took him down to Joplin's, giving him some wild yarn that he would swallow, and it would persuade him to stay there for a few days. That wasn't hard, since he didn't know anything about either of the $20,000 checks. You and your pal Kilcourse knew that if Pangburn disappeared, nobody would ever know that he hadn't forged the Axford check, and nobody would ever suspect that the second check was phony. You'd have killed him quietly. But when Porky tipped you off that I was on my way down, you had to move quick, so you shot him down. That's the truth of it, I yelled. All this while she had watched me with wide gray eyes that were calm and tender, but now they clouded a little, and a pucker of pain drew her brows together. I yanked my head away and got the car in motion. Just before we swept into Redwood City, one of her hands came up to my forearm, rested there for a second, patted the arm twice, and withdrew. I didn't look at her, nor, I think, did she look at me while she was being booked. She gave her name as Jeanie Delano, and refused to make any statement until she had seen an attorney. It all took a very few minutes. As she was being led away, she stopped and asked if she might speak privately with me. We went together to a far corner of the room. She put her mouth close to my ear so that her breath was warm again on my cheek as it had been in the car, and whispered the vilest epithet of which the English language is capable. Then she walked out to her cell. End of The Girl with the Silver Eyes, Part 2 The Golden Horseshoe, Part 1 I haven't anything very exciting to offer you this time, Vince Richmond said as we shook hands. I want you to find a man for me, a man who is not a criminal. There was an apology in his voice. The last couple of jobs this lean, gray-faced attorney had thrown my way had run to gunplay and other forms of rioting, and I suppose he thought anything less than that would put me to sleep. It was a time when he might have been right, when I was the young sprout of twenty or so, newly attached to the Continental Detective Agency. But the fifteen years that had slid by since then had dulled my appetite for rough stuff— I don't mean that I shuddered whenever I considered the possibility of some bird taking a poke at me, but I didn't call that day a total loss in which nobody tried to puncture my short, fat carcass. The man I want found, the lawyer went on as we sat down, is an English architect named Norman Ashcraft. He is a man of about thirty-seven, five feet ten inches tall, well-built and fair-skinned, with light hair and blue eyes. Four years ago he was a typical specimen of the clean-cut blonde Britisher. He may not be like that now. Those four years have been rather hard ones for him, I imagine. 
I want you to find him for Mrs. Ashcraft, his wife. I know your agency's rule against meddling with family affairs, but I can assure you that no matter how things turn out, there will be no divorce proceedings in which you will be involved. Here is the story. Four years ago, the Ashcrafts were living together in England, in Bristol. It seems that Mrs. Ashcraft is of a very jealous disposition, and he was rather high-strung. Furthermore, he had only what money he earned at his profession, while she had inherited quite a bit from her parents. Ashcroft was rather foolishly sensitive about being the husband of a wealthy woman, was inclined to go out of his way to show that he was not dependent upon her money, that he wouldn't be influenced by it. Foolish, of course, but just the sort of attitude a man of his temperament would assume. One night she accused him of paying too much attention to another woman. They quarreled, and he packed up and left. She was repentant within a week, especially repentant, since she had learned that her suspicion had no foundation outside of her own jealousy, and she tried to find him. But he was gone. It became manifest that he had left England. She had him searched for in Europe, in Canada, in Australia, and in the United States. She succeeded in tracing him from Bristol to New York and then to Detroit, where he had been arrested and fined for disturbing the peace in a drunken row of some sort. After that, he dropped out of sight until he bobbed up in Seattle ten months later. The attorney hunted through the papers on his desk and found a memorandum. On May 23, 1923, he shot and killed a burglar in his room in a hotel there. The Seattle police seemed to have suspected that there was something funny about the shooting, but had nothing to hold Ashcraft on. The man he killed was undoubtedly a burglar. Then Ashcraft disappeared again, and nothing was heard of him until just about a year ago. Mrs. Ashcraft had advertisements inserted in the personal columns of papers in the principal American cities. One day she received a letter from him from San Francisco. It was a very formal letter, and simply requested her to stop advertising. Although he was through with the name Norman Ashcraft, he wrote, he disliked seeing it published in every newspaper he read. She mailed a letter to him at the general delivery window here, and used another advertisement to tell him about it. He answered it, rather caustically. She wrote him again, asking him to come home. He refused, though he seemed less bitter toward her. They exchanged several letters, and she learned that he had become a drug addict, and that what was left of his pride would not let him return to her until he looked and was at least somewhat like his former self. She persuaded him to accept enough money from her to straighten himself out. She sent him this money each month in care of general delivery here. Meanwhile, she closed up her affairs in England. She had no close relatives to hold her there and came to San Francisco to be on hand when her husband was ready to return to her. A year has gone. She still sends him money each month. She still waits for him to come back to her. He has repeatedly refused to see her, and his letters are evasive, filled with accounts of the struggle he is having, making headway against the drug one month, slipping back the next. She suspects by now, of course, that he has no intention of ever coming back to her, that he does not intend giving up the drug, that he is simply using her as a source of income. I have urged her to discontinue the monthly allowance for a while. That would at least bring about an interview, I think, and she could learn definitely what to expect. But she will not do that. 
You see, she blames herself for this present condition. She thinks her foolish flare of jealousy is responsible for his plight, and she is afraid to do anything that might either hurt him or induce him to hurt himself further. Her mind is unchangeably made up in that respect. She wants him back, wants him straightened out. But if he will not come, then she is content to continue the payments for the rest of his life. But she wants to know what she is to expect. She wants to end this devilish uncertainty in which she has been living. What we want, then, is for you to find Ashcraft. We want to know whether there is any likelihood of his ever becoming a man again, or whether he has gone beyond redemption. There is your job. Find him, learn whatever you can about him, and then, after we know something, we will decide whether it is wiser to force an interview between them in hopes that she will be able to influence him or not. I'll try it, I said. When does Mrs. Ashcraft send him his monthly allowance? On the first of each month. Today is the 28th. That'll give me three days to wind up a job I have on hand. Got a photo of him? Unfortunately, no. In her anger, immediately after the row, Mrs. Ashcraft destroyed everything she had that would remind her of him but I don't think a photograph would be of any great help at the post office. Without consulting me, Mrs. Ashcraft watched for her husband there on several occasions and did not see him. It is more than likely that he has someone else call for his mail. I got up and reached for my hat. See you around the second of the month, I said, as I left the office. 2. On the afternoon of the 1st, I went down to the post office and got hold of Lusk, the inspector in charge of the division at the time. I've got a line on a scratcher from up north, I told Lusk, who was supposed to be getting his mail at the window. Will you fix it up so I can get a spot on him? Post office inspectors are all tied up with rules and regulations that forbid their giving assistance to private detectives except on certain criminal matters. But a friendly inspector doesn't have to put you through the third degree. You lie to him so that he will have an alibi in case there's a kickback, and whether he thinks you're lying or not doesn't matter. So presently I was downstairs again, loitering within sight of the A to D window, with a clerk at the window instructed to give me the office when Ashcraft's mail was called for. There was no mail for him there at the time. Mrs. Ashcraft's letter would hardly get to the clerk's that afternoon, but I was taking no chances. I stayed on the job until the windows closed at 8 o'clock and then went home. At a few minutes after 10 the next morning, I got my action. One of the clerks gave me the signal. A small man in a blue suit and a soft gray hat was walking away from the window with an envelope in his hand. A man of perhaps 40 years, although he looked older. His face was pasty, his feet dragged, and although the clothes were fairly new, they needed brushing and pressing. He came straight to the desk in front of which I stood fiddling with some papers. Out of the tail of my eye, I saw that he had not opened the envelope in his hand, was not going to open it. He took a large envelope from his pocket, and I got just enough of a glimpse of its front to see that it was already stamped and addressed. I twisted my neck out of joint trying to read the address, but failed. He kept the address side against his body, put the letter he had got from the window in it, and licked the flap backwards so that there was no possible way for anybody to see the front of the envelope. Then he rubbed the flap down carefully and turned toward the mailing slots. I went after him. There was nothing to do but to pull the always reliable stumble. I overtook him, stepped close, and faked a fall on the marble floor, bumping into him, grabbing him as if to regain my balance. It went rotten. In the middle of my stunt, my foot really did slip, and we went down on the floor like a pair of wrestlers, with him under me. To botch the trick thoroughly, he fell with the envelope pinned under him. I scrambled up, yanked him to his feet, mumbled an apology, and almost had to push him out of the way to beat him to the envelope that lay face down on the floor. I had to turn it over as I handed it to him in order to get the address. 
Mr. Edward Bohannon, Golden Horseshoe Cafe, Tijuana, Baja, California, Mexico. I had the address, but I had tipped my mitt. There was no way in God's world for this little man in blue to miss knowing that I had been trying to get that address. I dusted myself off while he put his envelope through the slot. He didn't come back past me, but went on down toward the Mission Street exit. I couldn't let him get away with what he knew. I didn't want Ashcraft tipped off before I got to him. I would have to try another trick as ancient as the one the slippery floor had bungled for me. I set out after the little man again. Just as I reached his side, he turned his head to see if he was being followed. "'Hello, Mickey,' I hailed him. "'How's everything in shy?' "'You got me wrong,' he spoke out of the side of his gray-lipped mouth, not stopping. "'I don't know nothing about shy.' His eyes were pale blue with needlepoint pupils, the eyes of a heroin or morphine user. "'Quit stalling,' I walked along at his side. We had left the building by this time and were going down Mission Street. "'You fell off the rattler only this morning.' He stopped on the sidewalk and faced me. "'Me? Who do you think I am?' "'You're Mickey Parker. The Dutchman gave us the rap that you were headed here. They got him if you don't already know it.' "'You're cuckoo,' he sneered. "'I don't know what the hell you're talking about.' "'That was nothing. Neither did I. I raised my right hand in my overcoat pocket. "'Now I'll tell one,' I growled at him. "'And keep your hands away from your clothes, or I'll let the guts out of you.' He flinched back from my bulging pocket. "'Hey, listen, brother,' he begged. "'You got me wrong, on the level. "'My name ain't Mickey Parker, and I ain't been in Chai in six years. "'I've been here in Frisco for a solid year, and that's the truth. "'You gotta show me.' "'I can do it,' he exclaimed all eagerness. "'You come down the drag with me, and I'll show you. "'My name's Ryan, and I've been living around the corner here on 6th Street for six or eight months.' "'Ryan?' I asked. Yes, John Ryan. I chalked that up against him. Of course, there have been Ryans christened John, but not enough of them to account for the number of times that name appears in criminal records. I don't suppose there are three old-time Yeggs in the country who haven't used the name at least once. It's the John Smith of Yeggdom. This particular John Ryan led me around to a house on 6th Street, where the landlady, a rough-hewn woman of fifty with bare arms that were haired and muscled like the village smithies, assured me that her tenant had, to her positive knowledge, been in San Francisco for months, and that she remembered seeing him at least once a day for a couple of weeks back. If I had really been suspicious that this Ryan was my mythical Mickey Parker from Chicago, I wouldn't have taken the woman's word for it but as it was, I pretended to be satisfied. That seemed to be all right, then. Mr. Ryan had been led astray, had been convinced that I had mistaken him for another crook, and that I was not interested in the Ashcraft letter. I would be safe, reasonably safe, in letting the situation go as it stood. But loose ends worry me, and you can't always count on people doing and thinking what you want. This bird was a hophead and he had given me a phony-sounding name, so... "'What do you do for a living?' I asked him. "'I ain't been doing nothing for a couple of months,' he pattered, "'but, but I expect to open a lunchroom with a fellow next week.' "'Let's go to your room,' I suggested. "'I want to talk to you.' He wasn't enthusiastic, but he took me up. He had two rooms and a kitchen on the third floor. They were dirty, foul-smelling rooms. I dangled a leg from the corner of a table and waved him into a squeaky rocking chair in front of me. His pasty face and dopey eyes were uneasy. "'Where's Ashcraft?' I threw at him. He jerked and then looked at the floor. "'I don't know what you're talking about,' he mumbled. "'You'd better figure it out,' I advised him, "'or there's a nice cool cell down on the booby hatch that will be wrapped around you.' "'You ain't got nothing on me.' "'What of that? How'd you like to do a thirty or sixty on a vague charge?' "'Vague hell!' he snarled, looking at me. "'I got five hundred smacks in my kick. Does that look like you can vague me?' I grinned down at him. "'You know better than that, Ryan. A pocket full of money will get you nothing in California. You've got no job. You can't show where your money comes from. You're made to order for the vague law.' I had this bird figured as a dope peddler. 
if he was, or was anything else off-color that might come to light when it was vagued, the chances were that he would be willing to sell Ashcraft out to save himself, especially since, so far as I knew, Ashcraft wasn't on the wrong side of the criminal law. If I were you, I went on while he stared at the floor and thought, I'd be a nice, obliging fellow and do my talking now. You're... He twisted sidewise in his chair and one of his hands went behind him. I kicked him out of his chair. The table slipped under me or I would have stretched him. As it was, the foot that I aimed at his jaw took him on the chest and carried him over backward with a rocking chair piled on top of him. I pulled the chair off and took his gun, a cheap nickel-plated thirty-two. Then I went back to my seat on the corner of the table. He had only that one flash of fight in him. He got up, sniveling. I'll tell you, I don't want no trouble, and it ain't nothing to me. I didn't know there was anything wrong. This Ashcraft told me he was just stringing his wife along. He gave me ten bucks a throw to get this letter every month and send it to him in Tijuana. I knowed him here, and when he went south six months ago, he's got a girl down there. I promised I'd do it for him. I knowed it was money. He said it was his alimony, but I didn't know there was nothing wrong. What sort of an hombre is this Ashcraft? What's his craft? I don't know. He could be a con man. He's got a good front. He's an Englishman and mostly goes by the name of Ed Bohannon. He hits the hop. I don't use it myself. <laughs> that was a good one. But you know how it is in a burg like this. A man runs into all kinds of people. I don't know nothing about what he's up to. I just send the money every month and get my ten. That was all I could get out of him. He couldn't or wouldn't tell me where Ashcraft had lived in San Francisco or who he had mobbed up with. However, I had learned that Bohannon was Ashcraft and not another go-between, and that was something. Ryan squawked his head off when he found that I was going to vague him anyway. For a moment it looked like I would have to kick him loose from his backbone again. "'You said you'd spring me if I talked,' he wailed. "'I did not. But if I had, when a gent flashes a rod on me, I figure it cancels any agreement we might have had. Come on.' I couldn't afford to let him run around loose until I got in touch with Ashcraft. He would have been sending a telegram before I was three blocks away, and my quarry would be on his merry way to points north, east, south, and west. It was a good hunch I played in nabbing Ryan. When he was fingerprinted at the Hall of Justice, he turned out to be one Fred Rooney, alias Jamoka, a peddler and smuggler who had crushed out of the federal prison at Leavenworth, leaving eight years of a tenor still unserved. "'Will you sew him up for a couple of days?' I asked the captain of the city jail. "'I've got work to do that will go smoother if he can't get any word out for a while.' "'Sure,' the captain promised. "'The federal people won't take him off our hands for two or three days. I'll keep him airtight until then.' Three. From the jail I went up to Vance Richmond's office and turned my news over to him. "'Ashcraft is getting his mail in Tijuana.' He's living down there under the name of Ed Bohannon, and maybe as a woman there. I've just thrown one of his friends, the one who handled the mail in an escaped con, in the cooler. Was that necessary? Richmond asked. We don't want to work any hardships. We're really trying to help Ashcraft, you know. I could have spared this bird, I admitted, but what for? He was all wrong. If Ashcraft can be brought back to his wife... He's better off with some of his shady friends out of the way. If he can't, what's the difference? Anyway, we've got one line on him safely stowed away where we can find it when we want it. The attorney shrugged and reached for the telephone. He called a number. Is Mrs. Ashcraft there? This is Mr. Richmond. No, we haven't exactly found him, but I think we know where he is. Yes. In about fifteen minutes. He put down the telephone and stood up. We'll run up to Mrs. Ashcraft's house and see her. Fifteen minutes later, we were getting out of Richmond's car in Jackson Street near Goff. The house was a three-story white stone building set behind a carefully sodded little lawn with an iron railing around it. Mrs. Ashcraft received us in a drawing room on the second floor. A tall woman of less than thirty, slimly beautiful in a gray dress. Clear was the word that best fits her, 
It described the blue of her eyes, the pink-white of her skin, and the light brown of her hair. Richmond introduced me to her, and then I told her what I had learned, omitting the part about the woman in Tijuana. Nor did I tell her that the chances were her husband was a crook nowadays. Mr. Ashcraft is in Tijuana, I've been told. He left San Francisco about six months ago. His mail is being forwarded to him in care of a cafe down there under the name of Edward Bohannon. Her eyes lighted up happily, but she didn't throw a fit. She wasn't that sort. She addressed the attorney. Shall I go down, or will you? Richmond shook his head. Neither. You certainly shouldn't go, and I cannot. Not at present. I must be in Eureka by the day after tomorrow, and shall have to spend several days there, he turned to me. You'll have to go. You can no doubt handle it better than I could. You will know what to do and how to do it. There are no definite instructions I can give you. Your course will have to depend on Mr. Ashcraft's attitude and condition. Mrs. Ashcraft doesn't wish to force herself on him, but neither does she wish to leave anything undone that might help him. Mrs. Ashcraft held a strong, slender hand out to me. You will do whatever you think wisest. It was partly a question, partly an expression of confidence. I will, I promised. I like this Mrs. Ashcraft. 4. Tijuana hadn't changed much in the two years I had been away. Still the same six or seven hundred feet of dusty and dingy street running between two almost solid rows of saloons, perhaps thirty-five of them to a row, with dirtier side streets taking care of the dives that couldn't find room on the main street. The automobile that had brought me down from San Diego dumped me into the center of the town early in the afternoon, and the day's business was just getting under way. That is, there were only two or three drunks wandering around among the dogs and loafing Mexicans in the street, although there was already a bustle of potential drunks moving from one saloon to the next. But this was nothing like the crowd that would be here the following week when the season's racing started. In the middle of the next block I saw a big gilded horseshoe. I went down the street and into the saloon behind the sign. It was a fair sample of the local joint. A bar on your left as you came in, running half the length of the building, with three or four slot machines on one end. Across from the bar, against the right-hand wall, a dance floor that ran from the front wall to a raised platform, where a greasy orchestra was now preparing to go to work. Behind the orchestra was a row of low stalls or booths with open fronts and a table and two benches apiece. Opposite them, in the space between the bar and the rear of the building, a man with a hair lip was shaking pills out of a kino goose. It was early in the day, and there were only a few buyers present, so the girls whose business it is to speed the sale of drinks charged down on me in a flock. Buy me a drink? Let's have a little drink. Buy a drink, honey. I shooed them away. No easy job, and caught a bartender's eye. He was a beefy, red-faced Irishman with sorrel hair plastered down in two curls that hid what little forehead he had. I want to see Ed Bohannon, I told him confidentially. He turned blank, fish-green eyes on me. I don't know no Ed Bohannon. Taking out a piece of paper and a pencil, I scribbled, Chaboka is copped, and slid the paper over to the bartender. If a man who says he's Ed Bohannon asks for that, will you give it to him? I guess so. Good, I said. I'll hang around a while. I walked down the room and sat at a table in one of the stalls. A lanky girl who had done something to her hair that made it purple was camped beside me before I had settled into my seat. Buy me a little drink? she asked. The face she made at me was probably meant for a smile. Whatever it was, it beat me. I was afraid she'd do it again, so I surrendered. Yes, I said, and ordered a bottle of beer for myself from the waiter who was already hanging over my shoulder. The beer wasn't bad, for green beer, but at four bits a bottle it wasn't anything to write home about. This Tijuana happens to be in Mexico, by about a mile, but it's an American town run by Americans who sell American artificial booze at American prices. If you know your way around the United States, you can find lots of places, especially near the Canadian line, 
where good booze can be bought for less than you are soaked for poison in Tijuana. The purple-haired woman at my side downed her shot of whiskey and was opening her mouth to suggest that we have another drink. Hustlers down here don't waste any time at all when a voice spoke from behind me. Cora, Frank wants you. Cora scowled, looking over my shoulder. Then she made that damned face at me again, said, All right, Cupy, will you take care of my friend here? And left me. Cupy slid into the seat beside me. She was a little chunky girl of perhaps eighteen, not a day more than that, just a kid. Her short hair was brown and curly over a round, boyish face with laughing, impudent eyes. Rather a cute little trick. I brought her a drink and got another bottle of beer. "'What's on your mind?' I asked her. "'Hooch?' she grinned at me, a grin that was as boyish as the straight look of her brown eyes. "'Gallons of it.' "'And besides that?' I knew this switching of girls on me hadn't been purposeless. "'I hear you're looking for a friend of mine,' Cupy said. "'That might be. What friends have you got?' "'Well, there's Ed Bohannon, for one. You know Ed?' I shook my head. No, not yet. But you're looking for him? Uh-huh. Maybe I could tell you how to find him. If I knew you were all right. It doesn't make any difference to me, I said carelessly. I have a few more minutes to waste, and if he doesn't show up by then, it's all one to me. She cuddled against my shoulder. What's the racket? Maybe I could get word to Ed. I stuck a cigarette in her mouth, one in my own, and lit them. "'Let it go,' I bluffed. "'This Ed of yours seems to be as exclusive as all hell. "'Well, it's no skin off my face. "'I'll buy you another drink and then trot along.' She jumped up. "'Wait a minute. I'll see if I can get him. What's your name?' "'Parker will do as well as any other,' I said, the name I had used on Ryan popping first into my mind. "'You wait.' She called back as she moved toward the back door. I think I can find him. I think so, too, I agreed. Ten minutes went by, and a man came to my table from the front of the establishment. He was a blonde Englishman of less than forty, with all the marks of the gentleman gone to pot on him. Not altogether on the rocks yet, but you could see evidence of the downhill slide plainly in the dullness of his blue eyes, in the pouches under his eyes, in the blurred lines around his mouth and the mouth's looseness, and in the grayish tint of his skin. He was still fairly attractive in appearance. Enough of his former wholesomeness remained for that. He sat down facing me across the table. "'You're looking for me?' There was only a hint of the Britisher in his accent. "'You're Ed Bohannon?' He nodded. Jamoka was picked up a couple of days ago, I told him, and ought to be riding back to the Kansas Big House by now. He got word out for me to give you the rap. He knew I was headed this way. How did they come to get him? His blue eyes were suspicious on my face. Don't know, I said. Maybe they picked him up on a circular. He frowned at the table and traced a meaningless design with a finger in a puddle of beer. Then he looked sharply at me again. Did he tell you anything else? He didn't tell me anything. He got word out to me by somebody's mouthpiece. I didn't see him. You're staying down here a while? Yes, for two or three days, I said. I've got something on the fire. He stood up and smiled and held out his hand. Thanks for the tip, Parker, he said. If you'll take a walk with me, I'll give you something real to drink. I didn't have anything against that. He led me out of the Golden Horseshoe and down a side street to an adobe house set out where the town fringed off into the desert. In the front room, he waved me into a chair and went to the next room. "'What do you fancy?' he called through the door. "'Rye? Gin? Tequila? Scotch?' "'The last one wins,' I interrupted his catalog. He brought in a bottle of black and white, a siphon, and some glasses, and we settled down to drinking. When that bottle was empty, there was another to take its place. We drank and talked, drank and talked, and each of us pretended to be drunker than he really was. But before long, we were both as full as a pair of goats. It was a drinking contest, pure and simple. He was trying to drink me into a pulp. 
a pulp that would easily give up all of its secrets, and I was trying the same game on him. Neither of us made much progress. Neither he nor I were young enough in the world to blab much when we were drunk that wouldn't have come out if we had been sober. Few grown men do, unless they get to boasting or are very skillfully handled. All that afternoon we faced each other over the table in the center of the room, drank, and entertained each other. You know, he was saying somewhere along toward dark, I've been a damn ass. Got a wife, the nicest woman in the world. Wants me to come back to her and all that sort of thing. Yet I hang around here, lapping up this stuff, hitting the pipe, when I could be somebody. Ach, architect, you understand? Good one, too. But I got in rut, got mixed up with these people. I can't seem to break away. Going to, though. No spoofing. Going back to little wife, nicest woman in the world. Don't you say anything to Cupie. She'd raise hell if she knew I was going to shake her. Nice girl, Cupie, but tough. Stick a bloomin' knife in me. Good job, too. But I'm going back to wife. Breaking away from pipe and everything. Look at me. Do I look like a hophead? Course not. Curing myself, that's why. I'll show you. Take a smoke now. Show you I can take it or leave it alone. Pulling himself dizzily up off his chair, he wandered into the next room, bawling a song at the top of his voice. A dimber mot with a quarter-tone strum, a bubbling of Max with her cove, a bingo fin and a crocodon drum, a waitin' for... He came staggering into the room again, carrying an elaborate opium layout, all silver and ebony, on a silver tray. He put it on the table and flourished a pipe at me. Have a little rear on me, Parker. I told him I'd stick to the scotch. Give you a shot of sea if you'd rather have it, he invited me. I declined the cocaine, so he sprawled himself comfortably on the floor beside the table, rolled and cooked a pill, and our party went on, with him smoking his hop and me punishing the liquor, each of us still talking for the other's benefit and trying to get the other to talk for our own. I was holding down a lovely package by the time Cupie came in at midnight. "'Looks like you folks are enjoying yourselves,' she laughed, leaning down to kiss the Englishman's rumpled hair as she stepped over him. She perched herself on the table and reached for the scotch. "'Everything's lovely,' I assured her, though probably I didn't say it that clear. I was fighting a battle with myself just about then. I had an idea that I wanted to dance. Down in Yucatan, four or five months before, hunting for a lad who had gone wrong by the bank that had employed him, I had seen some natives dance the Nagal, and that Nagal dance was the one thing in the world I wanted to do just then. I was carrying a beautiful bun. But I knew if I sat still, as I had been sitting all afternoon, I could keep my cargo in hand while well, I wasn't going to take much moving around to knock me over. I don't remember whether I finally conquered the desire to dance or not. I remember Cupie, sitting on the table, grinning her boy's grin at me and saying, You ought to stay oiled all the time, Shorty. It improves you. I don't know whether I made any answer to that or not. Shortly afterward, I know, I spread myself beside the Englishman on the floor and went to sleep. 5. The next two days were pretty much like the first one. Ashcraft and I were together 24 hours each of the days, and usually the girl was with us. And the only time we weren't drinking was when we were sleeping off what we had been drinking. We spent most of those three days in either the adobe house or the golden horseshoe, but we found time to take in most of the other joints in town now and then. I had only a hazy idea of some of the things that went on around me, though I don't think I missed anything entirely. On the second day, someone added a first name to the alias that I had given the girl, and thereafter I was painless Parker to Tijuana, and still am to some of them. I don't know who christened me or why. Ashcraft and I were as thick as thieves on the surface, but neither of us ever lost his distrust of the other, no matter how drunk we got, and we got plenty drunk. 
He went up against his mud pipe regularly. I don't think the girl used the stuff, but she had a pretty capacity for hard liquor. I would go to sleep not knowing whether I was going to wake up or not, but I had nothing on me to give me away, so I figured that I was safe unless I talked myself into a jam. I didn't worry much. Bedtime usually caught me in a state that made worry impossible. Three days of this, and then, sobering up, I was riding back to San Francisco, making a list of what I knew and guessed about Norman Ashcraft, alias Ed Bohannon. The list went something like this. 1. He suspected, if he didn't know, that I had come down to see him on his wife's account. He had been too smooth and had entertained me too well for me to doubt that. 2. He apparently had decided to return to his wife, though there was no guarantee that he would actually do so. 3. He was not incurably addicted to drugs. He merely smoked opium, and regardless of what the Sunday supplements say, an opium smoker is little if any worse off than a tobacco smoker. 4. He might pull himself together under his wife's influence, but it was doubtful. Physically, he hadn't gone to the dogs, but he had had his taste of the gutter and seemed to like it. 5. The girl Cupy was crazily in love with him, while he liked her but wasn't turning himself inside out over her. A good night's sleep on the train between Los Angeles and San Francisco set me down on the 3rd and Townsend Street station with nearly normal head and stomach and not too many kinks in my nerves. I put away a breakfast that was composed of more food than I had eaten in three days and went up to Vance Richmond's office. Mr. Richmond is still in Eureka, his stenographer told me. I don't expect him back until the first of the week. Can you get him on the phone for me? She could and did. Without mentioning any names, I told the attorney what I knew and guessed. I see, he said. Suppose you go out to Mrs. A.'s house and tell her. I will write her tonight, and I probably shall be back in the city by the day after tomorrow. I think we can safely delay action until then. I caught a streetcar, transferred to Venice Avenue, and went out to Mrs. Ashcraft's house. Nothing happened when I rang the bell. I rang it several times before I noticed that there were two morning newspapers in the vestibule. I looked at the dates, this morning's and yesterday morning's. An old man in faded overalls was watering the lawn next door. "'Do you know if the people who live here have gone away?' I called to him. "'I don't guess so. The back door's open. I've seen this morning.' He returned his attention to his hose, and then stopped to scratch his chin. "'They may have gone,' he said slowly. "'Come to think of it, I ain't seen any of them for... I don't remember seeing any of them yesterday.' I left the front steps and went around the house, climbed the low fence and back, and went up the back steps. The kitchen door stood about a foot apart. Nobody was visible in the kitchen but there was a sound of running water. I knocked on the door with my knuckles, loudly. There was no answering sound. I pushed the door open and went in. The sound of water came from the sink. I looked in the sink. Under a thin stream of water running from one of the faucets lay a carving knife with nearly a foot of keen blade. The knife was clean, but the back of the porcelain sink, where water had splashed with only small scattered drops, was freckled with red-brown spots. I scraped one of them with a fingernail, dried blood. Except for the sink, I could see nothing out of order in the kitchen. I opened a pantry door. Everything seemed all right there. Across the room, another door led to the front of the house. I opened the door and went into a passageway. Not enough light came from the kitchen to illuminate the passageway. I fumbled in the dusk for the light button that I knew should be there. I stepped on something soft. Pulling my foot back, I felt in my pocket for matches and struck one. In front of me, his head and shoulders on the floor, his hips and legs on the lower steps of a flight of stairs, lay a Filipino boy in his underclothes. He was dead. One eye was cut, and his throat was gashed straight across, close up under his chin. I could see the killing without even shutting my eyes. At the top of the stairs, the killer's left hand, dashing into the Filipino's face, thumbnail gouging into eye, 
pushing the brown face back, tightening the brown throat for the knife's edge, the slash, and the shove down the stairs. The light from my second match showed me the button. I clicked on the lights, buttoned my coat, and went up the steps. Dried blood darkened them here and there, and at the second floor landing the wallpaper was stained with a big blot. At the head of the stairs I found another light button and pressed it. I walked down the hall, poked my head into two rooms that seemed in order, and then turned a corner and pulled up with a jerk, barely in time to miss stumbling over a woman who lay there. She was huddled on the floor, face down, with knees drawn up under her and both hands clasped to her stomach. She wore a nightgown, and her hair was in a braid down her back. I put a finger on the back of her neck, stone cold. Kneeling on the floor, to avoid the necessity of turning her over, I looked at her face. She was the maid who had admitted Richmond and me four days ago. I stood up again and looked around. The maid's head was almost touching a closed door. I stepped around her and pushed the door open. A bedroom, and not the maid's. It was an expensively dainty bedroom in cream and gray, with French prints on the walls. Nothing in the room was disarranged except the bed. The bedclothes were rumpled and tangled and piled high in the center of the bed in a pile that was too large. Leaning over the bed, I began to draw the covers off. The second piece came away stained with blood. I yanked the rest off. Mrs. Ashcraft was dead there. Her body was drawn up in a little heap, from which her head hung crookedly, dangling from a neck that had been cut clean through to the bone. Her face was marked with four deep scratches from temple to chin. One sleeve had been torn from the jacket of her blue silk pajamas. Bedding and pajamas were soggy with the blood that the clothing piled over her had kept from drying. I put the blanket over her again, edged past the dead woman in the hall, and went down the front stairs, switching on more lights, hunting for the telephone. Near the foot of the stairs I found it. I called the police detective bureau first, and then Vance Richmond's office. "'Get word to Mr. Richmond that Mrs. Ashcraft has been murdered,' I told his stenographer. "'I'm at her house, and he can get in touch with me here any time during the next two or three hours.' Then I went out the front door and sat on the top step, smoking a cigarette while I waited for the police. I felt rotten. I've seen dead people in larger quantities than three in my time, and I've seen some that were hacked up pretty badly. But this thing had fallen on me while my nerves were ragged from three days of boozing. The police automobile swung around the corner and began disgorging men before I had finished my first cigarette, O'Gar, the detective sergeant in charge of the homicide detail, was the first man up the steps. Hello, he greeted me. What have you got hold of this time? I was glad to see him. This squat, bullet-headed sergeant is as good a man as the department has, and he and I have always been lucky when we tied up together. I found three bodies in there before I quit looking, I told him as I let him indoors. Maybe a regular detective like you, with a badge and everything, can find more. You didn't do bad. For a lad, he said. My wooziness had passed. I was eager to get to work. These people lying dead around the house were merely counters in a game again. Or almost. I remembered the feel of Mrs. Ashcraft's slim hand in mine. But I stuck that memory in the back of my mind. You hear now and then of detectives who have not become callous, who have not lost what you might call the human touch. I always feel sorry for them and wonder why they didn't chuck their jobs and find another line of work that wouldn't be so hard on their emotions. A sleuth who doesn't grow a tough shell is in for a gay life, day in and out, poking his nose into one kind of woe or another. I showed a Filipino to Olgar first, and then the two women. We didn't find any more. Detail work occupied all of us, Ogar, the eight men under him, and me, for the next few hours. The house had to be gone over from roof to cellar. The neighbors had to be grilled. The employment agencies through which the servants had been hired had to be examined. Relatives and friends of the Filipino and the maid had to be traced and questioned. 
Newsboys, mail carriers, grocer's delivery men, laundry men had to be found, questioned, and when necessary, investigated. When the bulk of the reports were in, O'Gar and I sneaked away from the others, especially away from the newspaper men who were all over the place by now, and locked ourselves in the library. Night before last, huh? Wednesday night? O'Gar grunted when we were comfortable in a couple of leather chairs, burning tobacco. I nodded. The report of the doctor who had examined the bodies, the presence of the two newspapers in the vestibule, and the fact that neither neighbor, grocer, nor butcher had seen any of them since Wednesday, combined to make Wednesday night or early Thursday morning the correct date. I'd say the killer cracked the back door, O'Gar went on, staring at the ceiling through smoke, picked up the carving knife in the kitchen, and went upstairs. Maybe went straight to Mrs. Ashcroft's room. Maybe not. But after a bit he went in there. The torn sleeve and the scratches on her face mean that there was a tussle. The Filipino and the maid heard the noise, heard her scream, maybe, and rushed to her room to find out what was the matter. The maid most likely got there just as the killer was coming out, and got hers. I guess the Filipino saw him then, and ran. The killer caught him at the head of the back stairs, and finished him. Then he went down to the kitchen, washed his hands, dropped the knife, and blew. So far, so good, I agreed. But I notice you skipped lightly over the question of who he was and why he killed. He pushed his hat back and scratched his bullet head. Don't crowd me, he rumbled. I'll get around to that. There seem to be just three guesses to take your pick from. We know that nobody else lived in the house outside of the three that were killed, so the killer was either a maniac who did the job for the fun of it, a burglar who was discovered and ran wild, or somebody who had a reason for bumping off Mrs. Ashcraft, and then had to kill the two servants when they discovered him. Taking the knife from the kitchen would make the burglar guess look like a bum one. And besides, we're pretty sure nothing was stolen. A good prowler would bring his own weapon with him if he wanted one. But the hell of it is that there are a lot of bum prowlers in the world, half-wits who would be likely to pick up a knife in the kitchen, go to pieces when the house woke up, slash everybody in sight, and then beat it without turning anything over. So it could have been a prowler. But my personal guess is that the job was done by somebody who wanted to wipe out Mrs. Ashcraft. Not so bad, I applauded. Now listen to this. Mrs. Ashcraft has a husband in Tijuana, a mild sort of hophead who is mixed up with a bunch of thugs. She was trying to persuade him to come back to her. He has a girl down there who is young, goofy over him, and a bad actor, one tough youngster. He was planning to run out on the girl and come back home. So, Ogar said softly, but, I continued, I was with both him and the girl in Tijuana night before last, when this killing was done. So? A knock on the door interrupted our talk. It was a policeman to tell me that I was wanted on a phone. I went down to the first floor, and Vance Richmond's voice came over the wire. What is it? Mrs. Henry delivered your message, but she couldn't give me any details. I told him the whole thing. I'll leave for the city tonight, he said when I had finished. You go ahead and do whatever you want. You're to have a free hand. Right, I replied. I'll probably be out of town when you get back. You can reach me through the agency if you want to get in touch with me. I'm going to wire Ashcraft to come up. In your name. After Richmond had hung up, I called the city jail and asked the captain if John Ryan, alias Fred Rooney, alias Jamoka, was still there. No. Federal officers left for Leavenworth with him and two other prisoners yesterday morning. Up in the library again, I told O'Gar hurriedly, I'm catching the evening train south, betting my marbles that the job was made in Tijuana. I'm wiring Ashcraft to come up. I want to get him away from the Mexican town for a day or two, and if he's up here, you can keep an eye on him. I'll give you a description of him, and you can pick him up at Vance Richmond's office. 
He'll probably connect there first thing. Half an hour of the little time I had left I spent writing and sending three telegrams. The first was to Ashcraft. Edward Bohannon, Golden Horseshoe Cafe, Tijuana, Mexico. Mrs. Ashcraft is dead. Can you come immediately? Vance Richmond. The other two were in code. One went to the Continental Detective Agency's Kansas City branch, asking that an operative be sent to Leavenworth to question Jamoka. The other requested the Los Angeles branch to have a man meet me in San Diego the next day. Then I dashed out to my rooms for a bag full of clean clothes and went to sleep riding south again. End of the Golden Horseshoe, Part 1「The Golden Horseshoe, Part 2 – 6 – San Diego was gay and packed when I got off the train early the next afternoon, filled with a crowd that the first Saturday of the racing season across the border had drawn. Movie folk from Los Angeles, farmers from the Imperial Valley, sailors from the Pacific Fleet, gamblers, tourists, grifters, and even regular people from everywhere. I lunched, registered, and left my bag at a hotel and went up to the U.S. Grant Hotel to pick up the Los Angeles operative I had wired for. I found him in the lobby, a freckle-faced youngster of 22 or so, whose bright gray eyes were busy just now with a racing program, which he held in a hand that had a finger bandaged with adhesive tape. I passed him and stopped at the cigar stand, where I bought a package of cigarettes and straightened out an imaginary dent in my hat. Then I went out to the street again. The bandaged finger in the business with a hat were our introductions. Somebody invented those tricks back before the Civil War, but they still worked smoothly, so their antiquity was no reason for discarding them. I strolled up 4th Street, getting away from Broadway, San Diego's main stem, and the operative caught up with me. His name was Gorman, and he turned out to be a pretty good lad. I gave him the lay. You're to go down to Tijuana and take a plant on the Golden Horseshoe Cafe. There's a little chunk of a girl hustling drinks in there. Short, curly brown hair, brown eyes, round face, rather large red mouth, square shoulders. You can't miss her. She's a nice-looking kid of about 18, called Cupy. She's the target for your eye. Keep away from her. Don't try to rope her. I'll give you an hour's start. Then I'm coming down to talk to her. I want to know what she does right after I leave and what she does for the next few days. You can get in touch with me at the, I gave him the name of my hotel and my room number, each night. Don't give me a tumble anywhere else. I'll most likely be in and out of the Golden Horseshoe often. We parted, and I went down to the plaza and sat on a bench under the palms for an hour. Then I went up to the corner and fought for a seat on a Tijuana stage. Fifteen or more miles of dusty riding, packed five in a seat meant for three, a momentary halt at the immigration station on the line, and I was climbing out of the stage at an entrance to the racetrack. The ponies had been running for some time, but the turnstiles were still spinning a steady stream of customers into the track. I turned my back on the gate and went over to the row of jitneys in front of the Monte Carlo, the big wooden casino, got into one, and was driven over to the old town. The old town had a deserted look. Nearly everybody was over watching the dogs do their stuff. Gorman's freckled face showed over a drink of mescal when I entered the Golden Horseshoe. I hoped he had a good constitution. He needed one if he was going to do his sleuthing on a distilled cactus diet. The welcome I got from the horseshoers was just like a homecoming. Even the bartender with the plastered-down curls gave me a grin. "'Where's Cupy?' I asked. Brother in lying Ed? A big squeed girl leered at me. I'll see if I can find her for you. Cupy came in through the back door just then. Hello, painless. She climbed all over me, hugging me, rubbing her face against mine, the Lord knows what all. Down for another swell souse? No, I said, leading her back toward the stalls. Business this time. Where's Ed? Up north. His wife kicked off. He's gone to collect the remains. That makes you sorry? She showed her big white teeth in a boy's smile of pure happiness. You bet. It's tough on me that 
Papa has come into a lot of sugar. I looked at her out of the corner of my eyes, a glance that was supposed to be wise. And you think Ed's going to bring the jack back to you? Her eyes snapped darkly at me. What's eating you? she demanded. I smiled knowingly. One of two things is going to happen, I predicted. Ed's going to ditch you, he was figuring on that anyway, or he's going to need every brownie he can scrape up to keep his neck from being... You goddamn liar! Her right shoulder was to me, touching my left. Her left hand flashed down under her short skirt. I pushed her shoulder forward, twisting her body sharply away from me. The knife her left hand had whipped up from her leg jabbed deep into the underside of the table. A thick-bladed knife, I noticed, balanced for accurate throwing. She kicked backward, driving one of her sharp heels into my ankle. I slid my left arm around her and pinned her elbow to her side just as she freed the knife from the table. "'What the hell's all this?' I looked up. Across the table, a man stood glaring at me, legs apart, fists on hips. He was a big man and ugly, a tall, raw-boned man with wide shoulders, out of which a long, skinny, yellow neck rose to support a little round head. His eyes were black shoe buttons stuck close together at the top of a little mashed nose. His mouth looked as if it had been torn in his face, and it was stretched in a snarl now, bearing a double row of crooked brown teeth. "'Where'd you get that stuff?' this lovely person roared at me. He was too tough to reason with. If you're a waiter, I told him, bring me a bottle of beer and something for the kid. If you're not a waiter, sneak. He leaned over the table and I gathered my feet in. It looked like I was going to need them to move around on. I'll bring you. The girl waggled out of my hands and shut him up. Mine's liquor, she said sharply. He snarled, looked from one of us to the other, showed me his dirty teeth again, and wandered away. "'Who's your friend?' "'You'll do well to lay off him,' she advised me, not answering my question. Then she slid her knife back in its hiding place under her skirt and twisted around to face me. "'Now what's all this about Ed being in trouble?' "'You read about the killing in the papers?' "'Yes.' "'You ought to need a map, then,' I said. "'Ed's only out is to put the job on you. "'But I doubt if he can get away with that. "'If he can't, he's nailed.' "'You're crazy!' she exclaimed. "'You weren't too drunk to know that both of us were here with you when the killing was done.' "'I'm not crazy enough to think that proves anything,' I corrected her. "'But I am crazy enough to expect to go back to San Francisco wearing the killer on my wrist.' She laughed at me. I laughed back and stood up. "'See you some more,' I said as I strolled toward the door. I returned to San Diego and sent a wire to Los Angeles, asking for another operative. Then I got something to eat, and spent the evening lying across the bed in my hotel room, smoking and scheming, and waiting for Gorman. It was late when he arrived, and he smelled of mescal, from San Diego to St. Louis and back, but his head seemed level enough. It looked like I was going to have to shoot you loose from the place for a moment, he grinned. Between the twist flashing a pick and a, a big guy loosing a sap in his pocket— it looked like action was coming. You let me alone, I ordered. Your job is to see what goes on, and that's all. If I get carved, you can mention it in your report, but that's your limit. What did you turn up? After you blew, the girl and the big guy put their noodles together. They seemed sort of agitated, all gog, you might say. He slid out, so I dropped the girl and slid along behind him. He came to town and got a wire off. I couldn't crowd him close enough to see who it was to. Then he went back to the joint. Things were normal when I knocked off. Who is the big guy, did you learn? He's no sweet dream from what I hear. Gooseneck Flynn is the name on his calling cards. He's bouncer and general utility man for the joint. I saw him in action against a couple of gobs, and he's nobody's meat. As pretty a double throwout as I've ever seen. So this gooseneck party was the Golden Horseshoe's cleanup man. And he hadn't been in sight during my three-day spree? I couldn't possibly have been so drunk that I'd forget his ugliness. And it had been on one of those three days that Mrs. Ashcraft and her servants had been killed. 
I wired your office for another op, I told Gorman. He's to connect with you. Turn the girl over to him, and you camp on Gooseneck's trail. I think we're going to hang three killings on him, so watch your step. I'll be in to stir things up a little more tomorrow. But remember, no matter what happens, everybody plays his own game. Don't ball things up trying to help me. Aye, aye, Cap. And he went off to get some sleep. The next afternoon I spent at the racetrack, fooling around with the bang tails while I waited for night. The track was jammed with the usual Sunday crowd. I ran into any number of old acquaintances, some of them on my side of the game, some on the other, and some neutral. One of the second lot was Trick Hat Schultz. At our last meeting, a copper was leading him out of a Philadelphia courtroom toward a 15-year bit. He had promised to open me up from my eyebrows to my ankles the next time he saw me. He greeted me this afternoon with an eight-inch smile, bought me a shot of what they sell for gin under the grandstand, and gave me a tip on a horse named Beeswax. I'm not foolish enough to play anybody's tips, so I didn't play this one. Beeswax ran so far ahead of the others that it looked like he and his competitors were in separate races, and he paid twenty-something to one. So Trick Cat had his revenge after all. After the last race, I got something to eat at the Sunset Inn, and then drifted over to the big casino, the other end of the same building. A thousand or more people of all sorts were jostling one another there, fighting to go up against poker, craps, chuck luck wheels of fortune, roulette, and twenty-one, with whatever money the racetrack had left or given them. I didn't buck any of the games. My playtime was over. I walked through the crowd looking for my men. I spotted the first one, a sunburned man who was clearly a farmhand in his Sunday clothes. He was pushing toward the door, and his face held that peculiar emptiness which belongs to the gambler who has gone broke before the end of the game. It's a look of regret that is not so much for the loss of the money as for the necessity of quitting. I got between the farmhand and the door. Clean you? I asked sympathetically when he reached me. A sheepish sort of nod. How'd you like to pick up five bucks for a few minutes' work? I tempted him. He would like it, but what was the work? I want you to go over to the old town with me and look at a man. Then you get your pay. There are no strings to it. That didn't exactly satisfy him, but five bucks are five bucks, and he could drop out any time he didn't like the looks of things. He decided to try it. I put the farmhand over by a door and went after another, a little plump man with round, optimistic eyes and a weak mouth. He was willing to earn five dollars in the simple and easy manner I had outlined. The next man I braced was a little too timid to take a chance in a blind game. Then I got a Filipino, glorious in a fawn-colored suit with a coat split to the neck and pants whose belled bottoms would have held a keg apiece, and a stocky young Greek who was probably either a waiter or a barber. Four men were enough. My quartet pleased me immensely. They didn't look too intelligent for my purpose, and they didn't look like thugs or sharpers. I put them in a jitney and took them over to the old town. Now this is it, I coached them when we had arrived. I'm going into the Golden Horseshoe Cafe around the corner. Give me two or three minutes, and then come in and buy yourselves a drink. I gave the farmhand a five-dollar bill. You pay for the drinks with that. It isn't part of your wages. There's a tall, broad-shouldered man with a long yellow neck and a small ugly face in there. You can't miss him. I want you all to take a good look at him without letting him get wise. When you're sure you'd know him again anywhere, give me the nod and come back here and get your money. Be careful when you give me the nod. I don't want anybody in there to find out that you know me. It sounded queer to them, but there was the promise of five dollars apiece, and there were the games back in the casino where five dollars might buy a man into a streak of luck that write the rest of it yourself. They asked questions which I refused to answer, but they stuck. Gooseneck was behind the bar helping out the bartenders when I entered the place. They needed help. The joint bulged with customers. The dance floor looked like a mob scene. Thirsts were lined up four deep at the bar. A shotgun wouldn't have sounded above the den, men and women laughing, roaring, and cursing, bottles and glasses rattling and banging, and louder and more disagreeable than any of these noises was the noise of the sweating orchestra. Turmoil, uproar, stink. 
Tijuana joint on a Sunday night. I couldn't find Gorman's freckled face in the crowd, but I picked out the hatchet-sharp white face of Hooper, another Los Angeles operative, who I knew then had been sent down in response to my second telegram. Cupy was farther down the bar, drinking with a little man whose meek face had the devil-may-care expression of a model husband on a tear. She nodded at me but didn't leave her client. Gooseneck gave me a scowl on the bottle of beer I had ordered. Presently my four hired men came in. They did their parts beautifully. First they peered through the smoke, looking from face to face, and hastily avoiding eyes that met theirs. A little of this, and one of them, the Filipino, saw the man I had described behind the bar. He jumped a foot in the excitement of his discovery, and then, finding Gooseneck glaring at him, turned his back and fidgeted. The three others spotted Gooseneck now, and sneaked looks at him that were as conspicuously furtive as a set of false whiskers. Gooseneck glowered at them. The Filipino turned around, looked at me, ducked his head sharply, and bolted for the street. The three who were left shot their drinks down their gullets and tried to catch my eye. I was reading a sign high on the wall behind the bar. Only genuine pre-war American and British whiskies served here. I was trying to count how many lies could be found in those nine words, and I had reached four, with promise of more, when one of my confederates, the Greek, cleared his throat with the noise of a gasoline engine's backfire. Gooseneck was edging down the bar, a bung starter in one hand, his face purple. I looked at my assistants. Their nods wouldn't have been so terrible had they come one at a time, but they were taking no chances on my looking away again before they could get their reports in. The three heads bobbed together, a signal that nobody within twenty feet could or did miss, and they scooted out of the door, away from the long-necked man and his bung starter. I emptied my glass of beer, sauntered out of the saloon, and around the corner. They were clustered where I had told them to wait. "'We'd know him! We'd know him!' they chorused. "'That's fine,' I praised them. "'You did great. I think you're all natural-born gumshoes. Here's your pay. Now, if I were you boys, I think I'd sort of avoid that place after this, because, in spite of the clever way you covered yourselves up, and you did nobly, he might possibly suspect something.' There's no need taking chances, anyway. They grabbed their wages and were gone before I had finished my speech. I returned to the Golden Horseshoe to be on hand in case one of them should decide to sell me out and come back there to spill the deal to Gooseneck. Cupy had left her model husband and met me at the door. She stuck an arm through mine and led me toward the rear of the building. I noticed that Gooseneck was gone from behind the bar. I wonder if he was out gunning for my four ex-employees. "'Business looks good,' I chatted as we pushed through the crowd. "'You know, I had a tip on beeswax this afternoon and wouldn't play the pup. "'I made two or three more aimless cracks of that sort, "'just because I knew the girl's mind was full of something else. "'She paid no attention to anything I said. "'But when we had dropped down in front of a vacant table, she asked, "'Who are your friends?' "'What friends?' "'The four jobbies who were at the bar when you were here a few minutes ago.' "'Too hard for me, sister,' I shook my head. "'There were slews of men there.' "'Oh, yes, I know who you mean. "'Those four gents who seemed kind of smitten with Gooseneck's looks. "'I wonder what attracted them to him, besides his beauty.' "'She grabbed my arm with both hands. "'So help me, God, painless,' she swore. "'If you tie anything on Ed, I'll kill you.' "'Her brown eyes were big and damp. "'She was a hard and wise little baby.' had rubbed the world's sharp corners with both shoulders. But she was only a kid, and she was worried sick over this man of hers. However, the business of a sleuth is to catch criminals, not to sympathize with their lady loves. I patted her hands. I could give you some good advice, I said as I stood up, but you wouldn't listen to it, so I'll save my breath. It won't do any harm to tell you to keep an eye on Gooseneck, though. He's shifty. There wasn't any special meaning to that speech, except that it might tangle things up a little more. One way of finding what's at the bottom of either a cup of coffee or a situation is to keep stirring it up until whatever is on the bottom comes to the surface. I'd been playing that system thus far on this affair. Hooper came to my room in the San Diego hotel at a little before two the next morning. 
Gooseneck disappeared with Gorman tailing him immediately after your first visit, he said. After your second visit, the girl went around to a Adobe house on the edge of town, and she was still there when I knocked off. The place was dark. Gorman didn't show up. 7. A bellhop with a telegram roused me at 10 o'clock in the morning. The telegram was from Mexicali. Drove here last night, hold up with friends. Sent two wires. Gorman. That was good news. The long-necked man had fallen for my play, had taken my four busted gamblers for four witnesses, had taken their nods for identifications. Gooseneck was the lad who had done the actual killing, and Gooseneck was in flight. I had shed my pajamas and was reaching for my union suit when the boy came back with another wire. This one was from Ogar through the agency. Ashcraft disappeared yesterday. I used the telephone to get Hooper out of bed. Get down to Tijuana, I told him. Stick up the house where you left the girl last night, unless you run across her at the Golden Horseshoe. Stay there until she shows. Stay with her until she connects with a big blonde Englishman, and then switch to him. He's a man of less than forty, tall, with blue eyes and yellow hair. Don't let him shake you. He's the big boy in this party just now. I'll be down. If the Englishman and I stay together and the girl leaves us, take her, but otherwise stick to him. I dressed, put down some breakfast, and caught a stage for the Mexican town. The boy driving the stage made fair time, but you would have thought we were standing still to see a maroon roadster pass us near Palm City. Ashcraft was driving the roadster. The roadster was empty, standing in front of the adobe house when I saw it again. Up the next block, Hooper was doing an imitation of a drunk, talking to two Indians in the uniforms of the Mexican army. I knocked on the door of the adobe house. Cupid's voice, Who is it? Me, painless. Just heard that Ed is back. Oh, she exclaimed. A pause. Come in. I pushed the door open and went in. The Englishman sat tilted back in a chair, his right elbow on the table, his right hand in his coat pocket. If there was a gun in that pocket, it was pointing at me. Hello, he said. I hear you've been making guesses about me. Call him anything you like. I pushed a chair over to within a couple of feet of him and sat down. But don't let's kid each other. You had Gooseneck knock your wife off so you could get what she had. The mistake you made was in picking a sap like Gooseneck to do the turn, a sap who went on a killing spree and then lost his nerve, going to read and write just because three or four witnesses put the finger on him, and only going as far as Mexicali. That's a fine place to pick. I suppose he was so scared that the five- or six-hour ride over the hills seemed like a trip to the end of the world. The man's face told me nothing. He eased himself around in his chair an inch or two, which would have brought the gun in his pocket, if the gun was there, in line with my thick metal. The girl was somewhere behind me, fidgeting around. I was afraid of her. She was crazily in love with this man in front of me, and I had seen the blade she wore on one leg. I imagined her fingers itching for it now. The man and his gun didn't worry me much. He was not rattle-brained, and he wasn't likely to bump me off either in panic or for the fun of it. I kept my chin going. You aren't a sap, Ed, and neither am I. I want to take you riding north with bracelets on, but I'm in no hurry. What I mean is, I'm not going to stand up and trade lead with you. This is all in my daily grind. It isn't a matter of life or death with me. If I can't take you today, I'm willing to wait until tomorrow. I'll get you in the end unless somebody beats me to you, and that won't break my heart. There's a rod between my vest and my belly. If you'll have Cupid get it out, we'll be all set for the talk I want to make. He nodded slowly, not taking his eyes from me. The girl came close to my back. One of her hands came over my shoulder, went under my vest, and my old black gun left me. Before she stepped away, she laid the point of her knife against the nape of my neck for an instant. A gentle reminder. I managed not to squirm or jump. Good, I said when she gave my gun to the Englishman, who pocketed it with his left hand. Now here's my proposition. You and Cupid ride across the border with me. 
so we won't have to fool with extradition papers, and I'll have you locked up. We'll do our fighting in court. I'm not absolutely certain that I can tie the killings on either of you, and if I flop, you'll be free. If I make the grade, as I hope to, you'll swing, of course. But there's always a good chance of beating the courts, especially if you're guilty, and that's the only chance you have that's worth a damn. What's the sense of scooting? Spending the rest of your life dodging bulls, only to be nabbed finally, or bumped off trying to get away. You maybe save your neck, but what are the money your wife left? That money is what you're in the game for. It's what you had your wife killed for. Stand trial, and you've got a chance to collect it. Run, and you kiss it goodbye. Are you going to ditch it, throw away, just because your cat's paw bungled the deal? Or are you going to stick to the finish, win everything, or lose everything? A lot of these boys who make cracks about not being taken alive have been wooed into peaceful surrender with that kind of talk. But my game just now was to persuade Ed and his girl to bolt. If they let me throw them in the can, I might be able to convict one of them, but my chances weren't any too large. It depended on how things turned out later. It depended on whether I could prove that Gooseneck had been in San Francisco on the night of the killings, and I imagined he would be well supplied with all kinds of proof to the contrary. We had not been able to find a single fingerprint of the killers in Mrs. Ashcraft's house, and if I could convince the jury that he was in San Francisco at the time, then I would have to show that he had done the killing, and after that, I would have the toughest part of the job still ahead of me, to prove that he had done the killing for one of these two, and not on his own account. I had an idea that when we picked Gooseneck up and put the screws to him, he would talk. But that was only an idea. What I was working for was to make this pair dust out. I didn't care where they went or what they did, so long as they scooted. I'd trust a lock in my own head to get profit out of their scrambling. I was still trying to stir things up. The Englishman was thinking hard. I knew I had him worried, chiefly through what I had said about Gooseneck Flynn. If I had pulled the moth-eaten stuff, said that Gooseneck had been picked up and had squealed, this Englishman would have put me down as a liar, but the little I had said was bothering him. He bit his lip and frowned. Then he shook himself and chuckled. "'You're balmy, painless,' he said. "'But you—' I don't know what he was going to say, whether I was going to win or lose. The front door slammed open, and Gooseneck Flynn came into the room. His clothes were white with dust. His face was thrust forward to the full length of his long yellow neck. His shoe-button eyes focused on me. His hands turned over. That's all you could see. They simply turned over, and there was a heavy revolver in each. "'Your paws on the table, Ed,' he snarled. Ed's gun, if that's what he had in the pocket, was blocked from a shot at the man in the doorway by a corner of the table. He took his hand out of his pocket, empty, and laid both palms down on the tabletop. "'Stay where you're at,' Gooseneck barked at the girl. She was standing on the other side of the room. The knife with which she had pricked the back of my neck was not in sight. Gooseneck glared at me for nearly a minute, but when he spoke it was to Ed and Cupy. "'So this is what you wired me to come back for, huh? "'A trap. "'Me, the goat, for you. "'I'll be your goat. "'I'm going to speak my piece. "'And then I'm going out of here "'if I have to smoke my way "'through the whole damn mech's army. "'I killed your wife, all right, "'and her help, too. "'Killed him for the thousand bucks.' "'The girl took a step toward him, screaming. "'Shut up, damn you!' "'Her mouth was twisting, "'working like a child's, "'and there was water in her eyes. "'Shut up yourself!' Gooseneck warred back at her, and his thumb raised the hammer of the gun that threatened her. "'I'm doing the talking. I killed her for—' Cupy bent forward. Her left hand went under the hem of her skirt. The hand came up, empty. The flash from Gooseneck's gun lit on a flying steel blade. The girl spun back across the room, hammered back by the bullets that tore through her chest. Her back hit the wall. She pitched forward onto the floor. Gooseneck stopped shooting and tried to speak. The brown haft of the girl's knife stuck out of his yellow throat. He couldn't get his words past the blade. He dropped one gun and tried to take hold of the protruding haft. Halfway up to it, his hand came and dropped. 
He went down slowly to his knees, hands and knees, rolled over on his side, and lay still. I jumped for the Englishman. The revolver Gooseneck had dropped turned under my foot, spilling me sideways. My hand brushed the Englishman's coat, but he twisted away from me and got his guns out. His eyes were hard and cold, and his mouth was shut until you could hardly see the slit of it. He backed slowly across the floor while I lay where I had tumbled. He didn't make a speech. A moment of hesitation in the doorway. The door jerked open and shut. He was gone. I scooped up the gun that had thrown me, sprang to Gooseneck's side, tore the other gun out of his dead hand, and plunged into the street. The maroon roadster was trailing a cloud of dust into the desert behind it. Thirty feet from me stood a dirt-caked black touring car. That would be the one in which Gooseneck had driven back from Mexicali. I jumped for it, climbed in, brought it to life, and pointed it at the dust cloud ahead. 8. The car under me, I discovered, was surprisingly well-engineered for its battered looks. Its motor was so good that I knew it was a border runner's car. I nursed it along, not pushing it. There were still four or five hours of daylight left, and while there was any light at all, I couldn't miss the cloud of dust from the fleeing roadster. I didn't know whether we were following a road or not. Sometimes the ground under me looked like one, but mostly it didn't differ much from the rest of the desert. For half an hour or more, the dust cloud ahead and I held our respective positions, and then I found that I was gaining. The going was roughening. Any road that we might have originally been using had petered out. I opened up a little, though the jars it cost me were vicious. But I was going to avoid playing Indian among the rocks and cactus. I would have to get within striking distance of my man before he deserted his car and started a game of hide-and-seek on foot. I'm a city man. I have done my share of work in the open spaces, but I don't like it. My taste in playgrounds runs more to alleys, backyards, and cellars than to canyons, mesas, and arroyas. I missed a boulder that would have smashed me up, missed it by a hair, and looked ahead to see that the maroon roadster was no longer stirring up the grit. It had stopped. The roadster was empty. I kept on. From behind the roadster, a pistol snapped at me three times. It would have taken good shooting to plug me at that instant. I was bounding and bouncing around in my seat like a pellet of quicksilver in a nervous man's palm. He fired again from the shelter of his car and then dashed for a narrow arroyo, a sharp-edged ten-foot crack in the earth, off to the left. On the brink, he wheeled to snap another cap at me and jumped down out of sight. I twisted the wheel in my hands, jammed on the brakes, and slid the black touring car to the spot where I had seen him last. The edge of the arroyo was crumbling under my front wheels. I released the brake, tumbled out, shoved. The car plunged down into the gully after him. Sprawled on my belly, one of Gooseneck's guns in each hand, I wormed my head over the edge. On all fours, the Englishman was scrambling out of the way of the car. The car was mangled, but still sputtering. One of the man's fists was bunched around a gun. Mine. "'Drop it and stand up, Ed!' I yelled. Snake quick, he flung himself around in a sitting position on the arroyo bottom, swung his gun up, and I smashed his forearm with my second shot. He was holding the wounded arm with his left hand when I slid down beside him, picked up the gun he had dropped, and frisked him to see if he had any more. He grinned at me. You know, he drawled, I fancy your true name isn't Painless Parker at all. You don't act like it. Twisting a handkerchief into a tourniquet of a sort, I knotted it around his wounded arm, which was bleeding. "'Let's go upstairs and talk,' I suggested, and helped him up the steep side of the gully. We climbed into his roadster. "'Out of gas,' he said. "'We've got a nice walk ahead of us.' "'We'll get a lift. I had a man watching your house and another one shadowing Gooseneck. They'll be coming out after me, I reckon. Meanwhile, we have time for a nice heart-to-heart -heart talk.' "'Go ahead. Talk your head off,' he invited. "'But don't expect me to add much to the conversation. "'You've got nothing on me.' "'I'd like to have a dollar or even a nickel "'for every time I've heard that remark. "'You saw Cupy bump Gooseneck off "'to keep him from peaching on her.' "'So that's your play?' I inquired. 
The girl hired Gooseneck to kill your wife, out of jealousy, when she learned that you were planning to shake her and return to your own world? Exactly. Not bad, Ed, but there's one rough spot in it. Yes? Yes, I repeated. You are not Ashcraft. He jumped and then laughed. Now your enthusiasm is getting the better of your judgment, he kidded me. Could I have deceived another man's wife? Don't you think her lawyer, Richmond, made me prove my identity? Well, I tell you, Ed, I think I'm a smarter baby than either of them. Suppose you had a lot of stuff that belonged to Ashcraft, papers, letters, things in his handwriting. If you were even a fair hand with a pen, you could have fooled his wife. She thought her husband had had four tough years and had become a hophead. That would account for irregularities in his writing. And I don't imagine you ever got very familiar in your letters, not enough to risk any missteps. As for the lawyer, his making you identify himself was only a matter of form. It never occurred to him that you weren't Ashcraft. Identification is easy, anyway. Give me a week, and I'll prove that I'm the Sultan of Turkey. He shook his head sadly. That comes from riding around in the sun. I went on. At first your game was to bleed Mrs. Ashcraft for an allowance, to take the cure. But after she closed out her affairs in England and came here, you decided to wipe her out and take everything. You knew she was an orphan and had no close relatives to come butting in. You knew it wasn't likely that there were many people in America who could say that you were not Ashcraft. Now, if you want to, you can do your stalling for just as long as it takes for us to send a photograph of you to England, to be shown to the people who knew him there. But you understand that you will do your stalling in the can, so I don't see what it'll get you. Where do you think Ashcraft would be while I was spending his money? There are only two possible guesses. I took the more reasonable one. Dead. I imagined his mouth tightened a little, so I took another shot and added, up north. That got to him, though he didn't get excited, but his eyes became thoughtful behind his smile. The United States is all up north from Tijuana, but it was even betting that he thought I meant Seattle, where the last record of Ashcraft had come from. You may be right, of course, he drawled, but even at that, I don't see just how you expect to hang me. Can you prove that Cupy didn't think I was Ashcraft? Can you prove that she knew why Mrs. Ashcraft was sending me money? Can you prove that she knew anything about my game? I rather think not. There are still any number of reasons for her to have been jealous of this other woman. I'll do my bit for fraud, painless, but you're not going to swing me. The only two who could possibly tie anything on me are dead behind us. Maybe one of them told you something. What of it? You know damned well that you won't be allowed to testify to it in court. What someone who is now dead may have told you, unless the person it affects was present, isn't evidence, and you know it. You may get away with it, I admitted. Juries are funny, and I don't mind telling you that I'd be happier if I knew a few things about those murders that I don't know. Do you mind telling me about the ins and outs of your switch with Ashcraft in Seattle? He squinted his blue eyes at me. "'You're a puzzling chap, Painless,' he said. "'I can't tell whether you know everything or are just sharpshooting.' He puckered his lips and then shrugged. "'I'll tell you. It won't matter greatly. I'm due to go over for this impersonation, so a confession to a little additional larceny won't matter.' Nine. The hotel sneak used to be my lay, the Englishman said after a pause. I came to the States after England, and the continent got uncomfortable. I was rather good at it. I had the proper manner, the front. I could do the gentleman without sweating over it, you know. In fact, there was a day not so long ago when I wasn't Liverpool, Ed. But you don't want to hear me brag about the select blood that flows through these veins. To get back to our knitting... I had a rather successful tour on my first American voyage. I visited most of the better hotels between New York and Seattle and profited nicely. Then one night, in a Seattle hotel, I worked the tarot and put myself into a room on the fourth floor. 
I had hardly closed the door behind me before another key was rattling in it. The room was night dark. I risked a flash for my light, picked out a closet door, and got behind it just in time. The clothes closet was empty, rather a stroke of luck, since there was nothing in it for the room's occupant to come for. He, it was a man, had switched on the lights by then. He began pacing the floor. He paced it for three solid hours, up and down, up and down, up and down, while I stood behind the closet door with my gun in my hand in case he should pull it open. For three solid hours he paced that damned floor. Then he sat down, and I heard a pen scratching on paper. Ten minutes of that, and he was back at his pacing. But he kept it up for only a few minutes this time. I heard the latches of a valise click, and a shot. I bounded out of my retreat. He was stretched on the floor with a hole in the side of his head. A bad break for me, and no mistake. I could hear excited voices in the corridor. I stepped over the dead chap, found the letter he had been writing on the writing desk. It was addressed to Mrs. Norman Ashcraft at a Wine Street number in Bristol, England. I tore it open. He had written that he was going to kill himself, and it was signed Norman. I felt better. A murder couldn't be made out of it. Nevertheless, I was here in this room with a flashlight, skeleton keys, and a gun, to say nothing of a handful of jewelry that I had picked up on the next floor. Somebody was knocking on the door. "'Get the police!' I called through the door, playing for time. Then I turned to the man who had let me in for all this. I would have pegged him for a fellow Britisher even if I hadn't seen the address on his letter. There are thousands of us on the same order, blonde, fairly tall, well set up. I took the only chance there was. His hat and top coat were on a chair where he had tossed them. I put them on and dropped my hat beside him. Kneeling, I emptied his pockets and my own, gave him all my stuff, pouched all of his. Then I traded guns with him and opened the door. What I had in mind was that the first arrivals might not know him by sight, or not well enough to recognize him immediately. That would give me several seconds to arrange my disappearance in. But when I opened the door I found that my idea wouldn't work out as I had planned. The house detective was there, and a policeman, and I knew I was licked. There would be little chance of sneaking away from them. But I played my hand out. I told them I had come up to my room and found this chap on the floor going through my belongings. I had seized him, and in the struggle had shot him. Minutes went by like hours, and nobody denounced me. People were calling me Mr. Ashcraft. My impersonation was succeeding. It had me gasping then, but after I learned more about Ashcraft it wasn't so surprising. He had arrived at that hotel only that afternoon, and no one had seen him except in his hat and coat the hat and coat I was wearing. We were of the same size and type, typical blonde Englishman. Then I got another surprise. When the detective examined the dead man's clothes, he found that the maker's labels had been ripped out. When I got a look at his diary later, I found the explanation of that. He had been tossing mental coins with himself, alternating between a determination to kill himself and another to change his name and make a new place for himself in the world putting his old life behind him. It was while he was considering the second plan that he had removed the markers from all of his clothing. But I didn't know that while I stood there among those people. All I knew was that miracles were happening. I met the miracles halfway, not turning a hair, accepting everything as a matter of course. I think the police smelled something wrong, but they couldn't put their hands on it. There was the dead man on the floor with a prowler's outfit in his pockets, a pocket full of stolen jewelry, and the labels gone from his clothes, a burglar's trick. And there I was, a well-to-do Englishman whom the hotel people recognized as the room's rightful occupant. I had to talk small just then, but after I went through the dead man's stuff I knew him inside and outside, backward and forward. He had nearly a bushel of papers, and a diary that had everything he had ever done or thought in it. I put in the first night studying those things, memorizing them, and practicing his signature. Among the other things I had taken from his pockets were fifteen hundred dollars worth of traveler's checks, and I wanted to be able to get them cashed in the morning. I stayed in Seattle for three days, as Norman Ashcraft. I had tumbled into something rich, and I wasn't going to throw it away. 
The letter to his wife would keep me from being charged with murder if anything slipped, and I knew I was safer seeing the thing through than running. When the excitement had quieted down, I packed up and came down to San Francisco, resuming my own name, Edward Bohannon. But I held on to all of Ashcraft's property, because I learned from it that his wife had money, and I knew I could get some of it if I played my cards right. She saved me the trouble of figuring out a deal for myself. I ran across one of her advertisements in the examiner, answered it, and here we are. I looked toward Tijuana. A cloud of yellow dust showed in a notch between two low hills. That would be the machine in which Gorman and Hooper were tracking me. Hooper would have seen me set out after the Englishman, would have waited for Gorman to arrive in the car in which he had followed Gooseneck from Mexicali, Gorman would have had to stay some distance in the rear, and then both of the operatives would have picked up my trail. I turned to the Englishman. But you didn't have Mrs. Ashcraft killed? He shook his head. You'll never prove it. Maybe not, I admitted. I took a package of cigarettes out of my pocket and put two of them on the seat between us. Suppose we play a game. This is just for my own satisfaction. It won't tie anybody to anything, won't prove anything. If you did a certain thing, pick up the cigarette that is nearer me. If you didn't do that thing, pick up the one nearer you. Will you play? No, I won't, he said emphatically. I don't like your game, but I do want a cigarette. He reached out his uninjured arm and picked up the cigarette nearer me. Thanks, Ed, I said. Now, I hate to tell you this, but I'm going to swing you. You're balmy, my son. You're thinking of the San Francisco job, Ed, I explained. I'm talking about Seattle. You, a hotel sneak thief, were discovered in a room with a man who had just died with a bullet in his head. What do you think a jury will make out of that, Ed? He laughed at me. And then something went wrong with a laugh. It faded into a sickly grin. Of course you did, I said. When you started to work out your plan to inherit all of Mrs. Ashcraft's wealth by having her killed, the first thing you did was to destroy that suicide letter of her husband's. No matter how carefully you guarded it, there was always a chance that somebody would stumble into it and knock your game on the head. It had served its purpose. You wouldn't need it. It would be foolish to take a chance on it turning up. I can't put you up for the murders you engineered in San Francisco, but I can sock you with the one you didn't do in Seattle, so justice won't be cheated. You're going to Seattle, Ed, to hang for Ashcraft's suicide. And he did. End of The Golden Horseshoe, Part 2